welcome Patsy and Claire from each side of the building. Um, okay, uh, the meeting will include a briefing from the Minister, uh, a briefing from NIEA on, the, on their draft business plan, two statutory rules, signing off on the Fisheries Bill report and consideration of a committee motion on climate change. Um, so Patsy and Claire, you're very welcome by Starleaf. It may be recorded and broadcast through Parliament buildings as, and also online. And you know the usual rules, you can use your devices so long as they are muted. Uh, okay, any apologies? No. No. Okay. Um, okay, draft minutes. I want to refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting on the 24th of June. It's at page 6 to 10 of your pack. And if you're okay, can I get agreement to sign off on those? Great. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, can I refer members to um, matters uh, to the memo from the clerk? Uh, sorry, moderation. The memo from the clerk at page 13 to 14, um, which outlines issues concerned to any protocol. The notice of the meeting, which took place on the 25th of June with the House of Lords EU subcommittee, is at page 16 to 17. And you will note that there are a number of follow up actions for the committee, one of which is to forward the EU subcommittee our key issues with the protocol. Um, the issues which we need members to um, discuss are as follows the EU approval of the, our ports of entry, the designation of goods at risk, the whole issue around arbitration, the provision of practical guidance for businesses. The volume of work to be carried out by the department and the committees and the, and the assembly, unanswered questions around uh, trade flows east, west, north, south, and openness, transparency, and accessibility of the joint committee. And following discussion with the members around these issues, the clerk will draft a letter to issue from um, myself as chairperson to the EU subcommittee, which will highlight outline our concerns that I have just mentioned. So. Does the member have any any questions around any of those issues that I am after mentioning there, uh, that um, that we can include in the draft uh, letter to the the large subcommittee? Sorry, Harry. Um, on the you're talking about um, handling and seeing manpower for the ports. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, what's the estimated number of new employees to facilitate? These posts and are, is there available trained persons around to, to fill the posts? When would be? Can we add that in? Maybe? Yep, but that is a concern. Thank you. And also, can another wee comment? Go for it. There was talk of um, two other ports maybe being brought up to standard. Would you say, mm. Lauren and Warren Point? I'm just wondering. Yep. What the progress would be on that? Mm. Is that okay? Yep. Thank you. Yep. You're right. This present in time is the, the airports and Belfast port are the, the designated yep. ports of entry. Um, so. Lauren is designated for live animals. Mm. Live animals. Okay. Live animals. Yeah. Uh, only. But it, it does because I've been on a visit to Lauren. It does bring in food. Okay. All yeah. the Asda trucks come in through Lauren, and I do know that some of the um, food processors bring in their uh, frozen chicken breasts right. directly in through Lauren. You know, and then they get um, yeah. There was some chat of them progressing to being yeah. almost up to standards, so it's just a yeah. yeah. You'll get a chance tomorrow to speak to the DARE officials on that in the in the closed session meeting. I can do that. Thank you. Well, I, I was just going to. I mean, I don't know if this is the appropriate point to raise it, but I, I caught the tail end of the news headlines my up. I, I thought it said the ports were engaged with a committee today, and I was wondering which committee. Maybe I got that wrong. Yeah, infrastructure. Okay, uh, uh, that's fair enough. Yeah. So, and maybe it's not appropriate, but it, no, it might have been useful in some of our evidence gathering around Brexit and some of these things that we actually had representatives from the port before yeah. us as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John? Very, very briefly, Chair. We have been told a couple of times in, in um, verbal replies that um, the uh, Treasury would meet some additional resource costs th yeah. th if those were required, mm. and it might be wise to try and help the seek of partners. Uh, Try and seek sorry, the help of partners to see if we can get more clarification around that. Mm -hmm. That'd be helpful. Yeah. Um, I, I, look, I, I do know from the written briefings that we have had here from the the, Bre the business Brexit group, and I actually had met the business Brexit group just at, uh, on a separate uh, a separate occasion at a meeting that was facilitated by uh, South Down MP Chris Hazard, and th their concerns are very, very, very severe. And of, uh, there's no impediment to trade. 
um, and that, that's very important. And if we draw back from the fourth of June meeting we had here, like it was red amber status at that <laughs> stage of getting ready for it, and like they had to the end of June to submit their plan. So we'll, we'll, obviously we'll find this out tomorrow, hopefully. Um, the, the, there's the plans to be drafted by now mm -hmm. or for mm -hmm. all of this, you know. The plan, that's the plan that was to go into the European Union. If the European Union were to designate the ports yeah. and they need to approve those plans. So, yeah. I felt that the House of Lords meeting last week was, was I thought they were, they were good listening ears they had from the meeting we had last week with the House of Lords EU group, do you remember? Or not the, was that the, wasn't it last week we met them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I thought they were, they were listening and uh, I they understood. They were, yeah. I thought they were very interested in what we had to uh -huh. say and in to take it all in. Yeah. That sounds like as well. And they, they seemed to think that what we were saying they'd heard before and mm. they were reiterating mm. the concerns that they'd heard. That was good. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think the committee got all the points across as well. So I think it was a good opportunity and certainly they, they seem to be very appreciative of, of the committee taking the time to do it as well. So, well done everybody and thanks to them as well. Thank you. In, in terms um, of that, there, there seemed to be a lack of interest from other committees on the meeting yesterday, chairs and vice chairs. I thought it was disappointing given the importance of it. I mean, there was, there was ourselves from this committee and the chair and vice chair of the economy committee, but nobody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think the meeting yesterday was the same issues were raised really yesterday that were raised last Thursday. It was wasn't it really, Philip? Same issues and again they they were listening and I think they understood the challenges that we face. So again, listen we can reach out and use as many friends as we have to help buy our case too and that's that, that's important, you know. So um are we okay then till uh, draft the letter then, highlighting yeah. some of the concerns, Stella? Um, so, I want to refer members to correspondence from the Department at 18 to 25 in your packs on the issues raised at the meeting on the 18th of June, including the number of um, number of level of penalties imposed on single farm payment due to fish kill incidents, and the consultation method for the science um, framework and the innovation strategy. Members, okay, to note this. Okay. Okay. Um, we're supposed to have an oral briefing now uh, from. The NIA, the members here. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just about the the um, minister will be coming. Up. Yeah. He's probably going to finish up this one here to put the minister mm. forward to allow the seats to be cleaned again. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I want to refer you to the memo from the clerk at pages 27, 29 in your packs, corresponds to the department at page 30 to 32, and the draft NIA business plan on page 33 to 57. I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome uh, Tracy Teig, the acting chief executive of NIA, Helen Anderson, the director of the natural environment, and Tim Irwin, uh, director of resource teams over in the in the public and gallery. So I'd like to ask the officials to uh, give your presentation. Okay. Chair, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to present our NIA business plan to you today. If you were put me to do a wee bit of scene setting at the, the start, that would be appreciated. Um, the agency plan underpins and supports the achievements of the targets in the DERA 2021 plan, which I know was presented to you last week on the 24th of June. And as for the DERA plan, the agency's plan is slightly different from what we would have done previously. The main focus for the agency this year will be dealing with the implications of and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the continuing preparations during the transition period following the UK's exit from the EU. In regard to the latter, our work will consider the implications of the environment of administrating the Northern Ireland Protocol. However, as we navigate our way through the COVID-19 pandemic and the transition period, our main priority will continue to be the protection of public health and the environment and to support our stakeholders and those we regulate. 
and we still will reflect the Department's vision of sustainability at the heart of a living, working, active landscape valued by everyone. As for last year's plan, the hierarchical approach is at the heart of this year's plan. At a strategic level, we still are focused on the programme for government outcome two. We live and work sustainably, protecting the environment. And then we have our agency's five key priorities, which reflect environmental sustainability, regulation, biodiversity, a compliant waste sector and water quality. And these are all underpinned by operational targets. Not surprisingly, much of the first three months of this reporting year has been reacting to the pandemic and dealing with key issues such as waste collections, fly tipping, closure and opening of country parks, reducing the number of regulatory inspections and then commencing them again, reducing monitoring and surveillance. All of this with our agency staff of around 500, equipped with laptops and working remotely. Very different circumstances to what we're normally used to. So video conferencing plays a key role now in terms of how we operate and how we communicate. So clearly it's very unprecedented times and we've got more of a focus on what must be done to reflect what's happening. More fundamentally though, it's clear that even prior to the pandemic, there was a huge growth in public awareness on the environment and this has now increased significantly. So although this year presents challenges for staff and the sectors we work with and the environment, we firmly believe that there's also key opportunities. All of this has necessitated doing things differently, such as the way we monitor or survey or surveillance and also our inspections. We're doing more with the use of remote sensing. And we've also got um, tourism recovery, focusing more on opportunities for staycationing. We'll be working with Tourism NI and the Department for Economy on the latter, making greatest use of our natural assets. Um, and as you're aware, we have our country parks and our nature reserves, um, and they will form part of that. So sustainability can be central to our recovery plans by progressing the department's green growth strategy to help address many of the long-term environmental and climate change challenges we face. The agency will play a key role helping to deliver the green growth agenda that we heard about last week from the minister. During 2021, the agency will continue to assist also with the department delivering a cross-departmental approach to the management of ammonia and nitrogen de deposition. And looking outside the agency and the department, our relationship with stakeholders are crucial. And I have to say they've strengthened as we have responded to COVID-19 and will continue to build on this. We have had much more regular engagement through the pandemic with local councils, with our waste industry, with the agricultural sector and the environment sector, um, just by the very issue of what has happened and how we've had to engage very, very regularly. Turning now to the targets that are in the plan, um, when we first developed a first draft of this, it was before COVID-19, back in January and February, um, and therefore there was many more than the targets we have in it today. But like the DERA plan, after the pandemic, it was decided that we should focus on three key areas. One being the exit from the EU, the second being uh, our response to COVID-19, and the third, the legal and statutory requirements of the agency. So we've got 13 targets for this year, and their other targets are then held in lower level business plans. So as I said earlier, it attempts to give a hierarchy of outcomes, objectives, starting with the programme for government, and then it comes down to uh, agreeing with the DERA vision, and, and then it will result in our own targets around five key, five key performance targets, very similar to the approach taken for the DERA plan, and all the targets are operational in nature. So in summary, we've got an important uh, emphasis on key issues such as waste regulation, improving water and air quality, enhancing and protecting our biodiversity, and contributing to issues such as key planning decisions. And of course, the targets in this plan can only be delivered if we have the appropriate resources. And while yes, that means funding, but more importantly, it means having professional and dedicated staff. And having worked through the challenges of the last three months, I've absolutely no doubt that both our external partners and the agency staff will continue to deliver through their dedication and professionalism. And we will collectively meet the challenges of the pandemic We've got more innovative thinking and more collaboration as we seek to progress new ways of working and new operating models. So finally, Chair, with your agreement, I'm happy that we either take questions on the targets or we go through them um, as, as you would like us to. Perhaps at this juncture, if you don't mind, we'll take a couple of questions. We have Rosemary and Philip down to ask questions, and John as well. Rosemary? Yeah. I'm looking here at the target 11. And that there, you know, 
can can you provide more detail in, in the target to develop an action plan in regard with regard to improving the quality of the planning consultations being submitted to DERA? And what are the associated time scales? Because this is a big problem I or for Manor people. Yeah, it absolutely is a problem, um, and we know last year we have a target to respond within 21 days, and last year our target was 69%, mm -hmm, yeah. um, and this year we're sitting in around 60%, so we have, and I'll bring Helen in, but we have a detailed improvement programme, Rosemary set out, to deal um, with our planning process, and that's working in line with BFI um, as the lead strategic um, planning body. Um, so we do have a programme, and it's aimed to be complete this year. Um, Helen, do you want to provide a bit more detail on that? Yeah, surely. Um, thanks, Tracy. You know, certainly just to reiterate that, you know, it's well understood that you know, both for us as an agency, we're a statutory consultee in the planning process um, you know, with um, DFI and the planning authorities and the councils obviously being the decision makers in that, but there's a recognition that having you know, capacity um, and speed um, with, within the system will Im improve performance all, all around. So, as Tracy was saying, um, you know, certainly you know, if we're sitting at 60% at the moment, that means 40% of people aren't getting their responses on time. We need to recognise as well um, that there's a range, all of the, the responses, some of those will be um, individual domestic or local responses, and others of them will be major or regionally significant. So the 21-day rule can actually be varied by agreement, um, and particularly with those larger ones, it, it, it's important to have that up front. Um, but as, as Tracy has already recognised, um, certainly on the major and the regional ones, um, the Department for Infrastructure had recognised the need to work with all of the statutory consultees collectively across the whole of the NICS to bring forward a proposal and a plan to make performance better for those. Um, and certainly we're playing a very full part in that because we're one of the major, major consultees. Looking then, um, and uh, you know, a lot of the issues come up at, at the local level for councils, as you're, as you're raising, um, uh, you know, in the example that you're providing. Um, and certainly, um, we have a lot of guidance already out there. You know, we've over 26 standing advice documents, and there's five best practice documents. But what we've committed to doing this year is to reviewing and revising those to make sure um, that there's as good advice as possible out there for applicants or for their um, um, agents um, or for the councils who are the ones who are going to need to make the decision. There are many decisions that councils can make themselves without um, necessarily having to come to the department if there's adequate information available through that standing advice. Um, we're also looking at the data sets that we have available, the raw data sets in terms of environmental evidence um, and um, seeking to improve those ev even further. Um, we're also looking at the handling, the arrangements, the process arrangements that we have within our own um, uh, agency and looking for further refinements um, across those. As Tracy refers to, we rely very much on highly professional staff. We've had quite a bit of turnover um, and there's a lot of um, training going on in-house and staff are very quickly. Um, um, improving both in terms of their capacity and the speed at which they can handle things. Um, and we're also, we are also doing much more analysis of the um, data flow that we have between ourselves <coughs> and the councils to look, uh, as you refer to a particular council there, but looking with councils at where there are particular issues in council areas and working through um, dedicated client officers in our own agency with those particular councils to see if there are ways that we can work collaboratively with them to help to speed up the process. So there is, there is a substantial amount of work and, and a lot of commitment, as Tracy says. A lot of that will be um, uh, moving apace this year, some of it will be ongoing beyond that time frame as well. Can I do yeah, it? Yeah, go for it, yeah. yeah. Uh, just to say, and what sort of contact do you have with the agents? You know, I feel there's a, use the word gap, but there, there's n not as much contact with the agents, and when they're putting forward planning applications, this is missing or that's missing, etc., etc. And I think there needs to be maybe a little bit more contact, a little bit more communication. Yes, I, I think that's a very valid point, um, and we see that, you know, um, even from the small application to the major. On the major, um, the pre-application discussion um, 
opportunity is obviously there and is availed of um, for those sorts of um, applications coming through, and we certainly would commit staff to be involved with those, but you're perfectly right. So we're hoping that actually in the, in the development of more of this upfront guidance, um, um, that, that actually there'll be more assistance available there for those agents. But I do take the point, and that's maybe something that we could do more in terms of actually working with them to see the extent to which the guidance works for them. On the agricultural ahead, applications, um, there would be more um, engagement with um, agents very often, to be honest with you. But certainly I, I'll make a note of that, and we'll take that point and consider that further. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, just just on, on, on that topic, mm -hmm. um, Helen or Tracy, could you could you explain the precise interface between yourselves and the SES? Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so um, the councils are the competent authorities for um, planning decisions, and whenever, if, um, before there was the um, uh, delegation of, of authorities out to the councils. Um, the function of actually um, assessing the habitats regulations requirement was performed by the DOE bit of the department over to the regional development part of the department to enable them to, to have a full competence in making a planning decision. Once the responsibility went out to the councils, they also had to have that in-house competence around the habitats regulation um, aspect of the, their decision on the planning uh, application, because they are the whole co competent authority for that. Mm -hmm. So um, th the, the, that's, that's what some people think that there's duplication there, but there's not. There's two separate statutory remits. DERA and um, the agency, as, as the part of DERA that performs the function, are a statutory consultee, and it's listed in the legislation the areas in which we are a statutory consultee for. Mm -hmm. So the council, by law, has to consult with us um, on, on those areas, but the council separately have to has, has to have its in-house competence to perform the habitats assessment role mm -hmm. in arriving at its own planning decision. Thank you. I know that's, it's a complicated mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that helps a bit. Okay, thanks. Um, if I just make a short we go answer to, to Rosemary's question, just on this, um, just you asked about the speed of this, and probably just to make sure the target is by the November. So it's not one of those where we've said, oh, we'll take a full year. We recognise that it is an issue. Um, and if it requires more engagement, we'll absolutely build that in because we are engaged with DFI, we are engaged with SAS, but in the likes yeah. of the agents then. If, I'm just thinking if we need to do a seminar or whatever, we will do that yeah. just to make sure that we haven't missed anybody on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Harry? Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you for coming today. Um, waste collection and fly tipping. Um, has fly tipping, would you say, reduced? Now back to there's never an, an acceptable level, but is it, would you say it's reduced to what would have been a normal level? Well, <clears throat> at the start of COVID-19, fly tipping became an absolutely... Oh huge issue um, and unfortunately everybody was tied up because we had the household waste recycling centres were closed, there was more people at home, um, waste wasn't being collected, people were clearing out houses so the waste was actually being left at the bring banks. So there was a whole raft of factors Harry that were actually Thank given, um, certainly the fly tipping had increased so at the minute now that the household waste recycling centres have opened again. Um, by and large, there is a steady decrease in the amount of fly tipping. But fly tipping has always been an issue. It's always yeah. been a problem. Yeah. And it's something that we really do need to, to tackle and to address. So we've done a lot of campaigns. I don't know whether you've noticed over social media. The whole of, from March onwards, one of the biggest things we tackled was in our media campaigns was about waste and fly tipping. Um, and asking people not to clear out their houses. So when we've now, I think, 68 household waste recycling centres opened, Thank, thank goodness. Um, and the councils are reporting, by and large, um, that it's back to a manageable status. So we do have um, a regular, uh, I think it's called a, a database, probably, just for sake of argument. Um, but it keeps it a waste tracking update where all the councils in, put into that. Um, and we keep track, and it's either red, amber, or green. And by and large, there's no reds that it's becoming an issue in any particular council. But when things flare up, for example, um, good weather, 
you know, you will find then the amount of fly tipping on beaches and parks will flare up. Um, we've experienced that ourselves in our country parks, but I know from talking to the councils, then there's a, 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 a consequence of that, and then fly tipping will, will be an issue. But the councils, by and large, are managing it. Whether Tim, have you heard anything on your side? No, ju just to say, as you say, um, it is being managed by all the councils at the minute, um, and there doesn't seem to be uh, a huge increase still going on. But it was at the start. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. There's never an acceptable level, but at least we're at a level now we can work with and try and pin it down. Yeah. Can oh, Laura request one? Go for it, yeah. Thank you. You were saying that you changed, or you have changed at the minute, how you monitor and survey things. The way you're doing it now, would you say that's working better, and will you continue doing it this way? Well, right. yeah, we're, we're testing it, yeah. certainly. Um, we've been forced to change the way we work. Um, so even in our regulation rule, um, they're normally always by way of um, physical visits, um, and we couldn't actually go out to maybe inspect factories or inspect businesses or organisations, and certainly we paused farm inspections. So we've changed the way we've done them in different <coughs> manners. Um, we've done a lot of desk-based reviews, so we get, the, we get it in through the computer and we go through the paperwork. Um, on the farms, we don't have any... Um, and some of the t tests that we do or the inspections, we don't have contact with the farmer. We have a different way of engaging there. And on the monitoring and surveillance, we're considering remote sensing, you know, in terms of trying to get um, a different way of gathering the data. So we're ro rolling this out, Harry, but yes. certainly um, if it's a more efficient way to do it, there's no reason why we wouldn't take this forward as the future model. Um, and again, um, for our staff, if they can work at home, they should work at home. That's the current model. But for a lot of our staff, the work is going out on the ground. Um, and we're just trying to find different ways of doing that. Um, and so far, so far so good, Tim? Yeah, um, as Tracy said, we have uh, an alternative method for doing the on-farm inspections. We no longer go into the farm farmhouse and sit with a farmer and go through the records. We're asking for those to be sent in, and then we'll look at those remotely. So there's no contact. <coughs> So um, it's good from a COVID-19 point of view, but maybe we lose a wee bit of interaction with the farmer and, and further discussion we might have had. On the monitoring and surveillance stuff, we still need to get out there and get on the ground to see what's happening and, and record some of the information. So as far as water quality sampling or so on goes, we're back doing that and bringing the analysis back. Okay, thank you, Chair. Hi, uh, Philip. Thanks, Chair. Just a comment on fly tapping, because I mean, it's something that absolutely frustrates and angers me. I, I had an early morning run this morning and I, and I noticed in a park, and I will not mention the location of the park, but uh, just at, at, the, at a summer seat, you know, a massive amount of unnecessary litter. And was even more frustrating was that there was a bin 10 yards away. I mean, it was absolutely disgusting. And the, the laziness and total disregard and selfishness of people who throw waste uh, anywhere, but particularly in parks, uh, where bins are located, uh, you know, it's absolutely disgusting. It's, it's an issue that we obviously all need to deal with together. My question uh, is in relation to Target Five. I mean, obviously, or sorry, Target Four. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the most damaging environmental uh, crimes, I suppose, uh, in the north is the Maboy waste site, uh, and there's probably justified frustration from citizens and groups who, who live uh, and work in the northwest and Derry and, and its uh, outer regions about the slow progress to get that solved. So, I mean, I just note in your target, uh, you have, you're preparing uh, a tender process. So could you give us an update on that and the speed of that and the likely work that will happen then in the aftermath of that? Okay. So we probably should um, start this by saying, obviously, there's a criminal case ongoing, mm -hmm. my boy, so I'm limited in terms of the level of detail that I can talk about um, on this, and I think we had planned to give a session before COVID-19 and, uh, and a visit to my boy um, to the committee. Um, so the court case is due to be heard um, in September, but although that case is running, um, we've still been doing a lot of action to try and address the issue on the my boy site, and you know the size and the scale of it, mm -hmm. Philip. So we have progressed with an outline of what remediation of that site would look like, um, and then we're taking that through to develop the options, um, and that's what this is about. So this is preparing the papers to go through for an integrated consultancy team to look and say, well, what actually uh, will need to be done on that site, um, uh, and we need the professionals in to help us do that, um, and that's two stages. Uh, once they do that initial piece of work, 
and look at what we've got so far, um, then we'll take it forward in terms of procurement. But it is um, linked in with the criminal case, um, and the timelines may actually um, be interdependent on, on one another in terms of how the criminal case goes forward in September, because obviously the list of documents is relevant in terms of a tender process. Okay, fair enough. Okay, sir. Um, John? Uh, John? Thank you, Chair. And can I thank Tracy, uh, Helen, and Tim for, for the report and answer so far, and also, as I've done previously with the Permanent Secretary and the Minister, ask through you, Chair, that they, they take away to, to the respective teams our appreciation of the work done in recent weeks and months by, by a workforce under um, tremendous pressure and stress. Uh, and we are grateful for that and the, the efforts to, to keep things moving. They have two questions, uh, Chair, which I'm happy to do t together. And the first one relates to um, matters around water quality and um, the cleanliness of our rivers, which is on page 10 of the agency report. Um, and in line with questions previously asked around river pollution and the levels of fines and penalties, can I ask again that, as well as aspiring to do better in this regard, has the time come to review the overall approach or to set up working groups or consultations to really determine whether or not current fines and um, levels of prosecution and outcomes are a sufficient deterrent to habitual um, polluters of our rivers and also where possible to maximise public engagement with a view to protecting our rivers? And I know, and I've had the answer before a number of times from a number of sources, that the Department of the Agency are not responsible for the outcomes in courts. Um, but I'm thinking that we, all of us in the agency and the Department, and those of us who serve the public, have a role to play <coughs> in um, presenting the case that current deterrents are not sufficient. The second question relates to page 15 of the report and the um, stated intention to protect and maximise appreciation of nature and the environment, and I, I concur, of course, with those sentiments. Um, in line with positive announcements about uh, green growth and a determination to see a green recovery, can we look at how the agency can work with the department to best utilise the assets and resources the department has in our forests and uh, country parks and, and, and other facilities? And also how we, with a view to green recovery, maximise a interdepartmental approach to that through um, DERA, of course, the Department for Economy, tourism agencies and others, as well as community engagement also. I'm just keen to know if those wider elements are being looked at in terms of the target on page uh, 15. Um, well, I'll quite a lot in there, John, in terms of, but first of all, um, thank you very much for your sentiments to staff, and we will pass that on. It's very much appreciated because staff have been working incredibly hard um, over mm -hmm. the last while. Um, on the water quality, um, I mean, you'll see yourself, we have said that you know, the, the water quality is a real challenge. It's sitting at 36% um, good status and against a target of 70%. Um, and we have taken um, such a series of actions over the last number of years to try and improve that. Um, and there's 40 indicators that you have to um, tick all the boxes in terms of water quality. Um, you might actually concentrate on two or three of them and get them fixed, only to find another one that fails. So, you know, that's the system that we're working in. Um, but we have um, issued recently the Significant Water Management Issues Report out for consultation. We got the responses back. That will inform how we go forward, and there may be different changes in that, but certainly um, the river basin management plans will target those key areas where they're declining. Um, but it is a serious issue, um, and it takes into account we look at the factors where the pollution is happening. Um, pollution still occurs. Our pollution numbers are still high. They've been high over the COVID-19 period. Um, we didn't see any necessary drop-off. We've had nine fish kills um, recently. Um, some uh, have been more serious simply due maybe to the weather conditions. So it is a serious issue and we are taking it seriously. Um, so this year we've got our plans for um, action plans in specific river areas, and Tim will come in a wee bit more detail on that. We're developing our third river basin cycle management plans. On the fees and the fines, and I'm assuming you're talking about pollution and even broader maybe in terms of um, even the, the waste side of the house as well. Um, we were just talking about that saying, yes, it is the judiciary, um, and the maximum fine in the magistrate's court is 20,000. 
Um, and if it goes to the Crown, it can be greater than that. They can direct it, and it has been in the past greater than that. Um, but we can certainly consider if there's more to be done in that area uh, or a case to be made, um, and we can, we can have a further consideration of that. We also have a route then um, where we can uh, ask for remediation costs, John, so where there's damage to you know, the river or the fish that we can ask. And we have had uh, cases where we've been awarded, um, I think the range is, Tim will keep me right, something like we've had 4,000 up to 14,000 pounds to actually remediate the, the damage caused. So um, on the water side, definitely you know, I agree with you, there's much more to be done. Um, and we are pushing the boat out to try and do everything we can. Tim, do you want to add anything more? Um, I suppose just on the um, repeat offenders, um, we are pushing, working with PPS, and say who decide uh, where, where the, whether the case goes forward. Or, but uh, they have pushed for some of those to be tried in the Crown Court, which then pushes the fine up. And we had a couple of thirty thousand, forty thousand pound fines. Um, as far as the fish kills are concerned, we work with the angling cl clubs to try and get remediation and uh, costs, and we. We factor those in to the trial. We push those forward in the trial to get a, a, uh, an award through the, the courts back to the club. Uh, then on top of that, the clubs themselves can take a private action, civil action for, for the loss. Um, so there are ways to, to, uh, to tackle that. Um, and I think uh, the other thing, um, just on the pollution incidents, um, Tracy's mentioned there's been no real change over the COVID-19 period. Um, and that's something that we're looking at in terms of where those are happening and the sensitivity of the catchments that they're happening in and targeting 20 catchments in our uh, work going forward this year to try and uh, work with industry, agriculture, NI water, the key polluters, and try and get a resolution to some of these. We're also, John, um, having a, a session with NI water um, specifically just to look at the whole um, water regulation and how we work together um, in terms of the issues, the pollution, um, their funding, the, the way we regulate. We also regulate obviously drinking water as well, so it's more than just rivers mm -hmm. and lakes. The second question you asked me about was a broader one around green growth and staycations and you know it's a very I hope it's a, a much more positive story because yeah. it's an opportunity that has arisen because of COVID nineteen. <coughs> Um, and I know you were interested the committee had expressed interest in it last week as well. So um, We've been doing an awful lot of work with our environmental uh, NGOs, um, and Helen as well has been involved in the Department for Economies Tourism uh, Working Group. Um, and there's a message obviously going out about using our natural assets, our natural resources. We're working with Forest Service on that. Um, there's links in with the Department DERA on food, um, on the food side of the house, on the equine side of the house. Um, uh, encouraging also in the agri-food sector. We know from our meetings that we've had through the COVID-19, you know, obviously the hotels, the B&Bs have all suffered as a consequence of you know, the, the tourism agenda falling off. So we're working collectively as a department um, on the whole staycation agenda. Um, and even on the broader green growth, um, the agency is definitely um, very involved in that and a whole range of issues, not only on that tourism agenda, but also working with Forest Service. Um, on peatlands, um, on the on the rivers, um, so there's a whole raft of issues that we could talk about on green growth. But we will be supporting that green growth agenda. But specifically on the staycations, Helen, you've been involved. You want to talk a wee bit more detail. Um, yes, certainly. Um, uh, in terms of, of addressing the COVID pressures whenever they arose, you know, the department recognised, um, you know, from day one that the assets that we had, you know, within the agency in terms of the, the nature reserves and the country parks, but also more generally within the department in terms of the angling estate and also the forests, that those provided great places for exercise, health and well-being. So the whole way through COVID since day one, they were never closed; they were kept open, and we have been as proactive as we have been able to, given the constraints and working within the guidance and appropriate risk assessment consideration in terms of relaxing those assets for use through the car parks, the toilets. Um, we're not, the cafes are starting to come on board now and the play parks will be coming on, um, certainly in the country <coughs> parks once we get into July. So even before the work began with the Department for um, Economy and Tourism NI, the department was very much putting its its, its um, assets front and centre and making them as available as it, as it possibly could could be it could make them. Um, but certainly the concentrated work of late has been around that this phasing of the staycation. Um, you know the next 13, 14 weeks worth of um, a dedicated campaign which commenced yesterday. 
and certainly, as Tracy has indicated, um, uh, there's a number of us within the department who are heavily involved in the steering group and the working groups and, and the task and finish groups around that. So we've been working very closely with Tourism NI and have fed messages in on their Discover NI website. Um, we have um, worked very hard across our own sites, but also more generally, considering you know, the environment as a whole in Northern Ireland around um, you know, just how best to play into that product. So the sorts, the sorts of messages that we're putting out there are very much along the lines of love the place, whether that's Dara sites or other parts of, of the uh, landscape of Northern Ireland. And that's not just the honeypots, it's also the hidden gems. And I know that questions were asked about that the last time around. We're very much into, you know, there's been questions there about um, fly tipping and about litter and such like. So we're very much saying leave no trace you know, respect the environment that you're operating in. A lot of the survey work that um, DFE and Tourism NI have shared with, have, with us have, has indicated the types of profile of the people who are likely to go. So it may well be that these are young people with young families or young adults who maybe tend to go for warmer holidays and other climes, but are staying here. So they may not, may not be as familiar with some of the key messages around that. So it's very much love the place. And as Tracy said, it's not just the nature. It's also the food, it's the equine, it's the angling. Um, you know, it's the full product that's, that's actually on offer there. And then be outdoor smart, you know, for people who are maybe um, sampling Northern Ireland landscape um, in a way that they weren't perhaps just as used to. So there's been a lot of work in, in around messages for tourism NI. Um, other messages that we, uh, we have got our press office and the My NI social behaviour change campaign within the department starting to look at how we can reinforce those messages um, and certainly put those out um, to, to make sure that the very best is enjoyed of the whole of Northern Ireland's environment but in a respectful way. And, and, and a way that works. And certainly on our sites, it is very much people come and enjoy, but try to choose ch times whenever they're less busy, um, because there is still the degrees of the social distancing and the constraints around COVID that need to be adhered to. Are you looking for a quick one? Yeah, yeah just, just briefly, and, and thank, thank all three for, for the, the replies there uh, to what were, was described as a pretty broad question to start with. But to hone in on, on part of it, and probably what, what, what you touched on there, Helen, and thanks again. Um, can, can I ask that um, if it's already happening and if it's not, can it happen, that the working group look at how we extend our um, nature and environment product? For example, I've raised recently the business of agritourism, and agritourism would be a more on-the-farm-based experience. Now, I'm aware there would be health and safety issues around that, um, but, but those, it's not that they could not be overcome. But on the farm experience, as opposed to your standard bed, or bed and breakfast or, or self-catering. And you could, probably any of us could guess just how many of farms, if they could offer that product, are also located quite close to some of our biggest tourist attractions. And in addition to that, if the working group could, in conjunction with the other bodies it's, it's working with, um, look at how we best utilise our natural resources. For example, if some service providers on outdoor pursuits, for example, are... You, are enabled to use our forest <coughs> parks that could attract the, the footfall there and family usage and etc so it's about, it's about broadening the product and if that could be examined i'd be grateful and some of that happens john service providers you know in some of the forest parks they're quite active and <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and we have a lot of for, for example castle well and there'll be a lot of uh, activities yeah. going on and um, with the council and with water sports and and so on so yeah uh, thank you uh, we're there we have 10 minutes left now with the minister four minutes comes in so claire Claire? And thanks for the presentation. Um, I suppose I have a couple of questions too, and I'll try and get them in quick, but I just want to back up um, or reinforce, I suppose, the points that John was making there. Um, and the committee have just received um, information from the department, specifically with regard to fish kills, and it showed us that over the period of 27, since 2017 to 19, um, there were 195 farms who breached um, the pollution levels are, are, were fined for um, for polluting the rivers. <clears throat> but when we look at the the total of the fines, I know that Tim has given the figure there of up to twenty thousand pounds. But I've looked at the average um, cost over those two years, um, and when we look at the numbers, uh, it's less than fifteen hundred pound is the the average um, that people are being fined, and also. When we look at even just in 2019 to 20, 19 to 20, um, there was 813 water pollution incidences, 
and um, broken down into the fines, it sort of works out as an average of £31.66p um, in average people are being fined. So I think there's a real disparity. Um, and obviously then PPS come into it, the courts come into it. But do you feel that you're well resourced enough to be dealing with this? Um, is there anything more that any NIEA can be maybe asking for or we could help with in terms of giving you the resource needed to deal with this going forward? So you can always do with more resources. It's always great to get more resources. But on the fines, um, Claire, um, I don't have that table in front of me, but obviously the pollution incidents are also rated high, medium and low. So there'll be different fines for different levels of severity. And that is probably maybe where the average in figures maybe not maybe totally reflective. Um, and I can come back to that table and have a bit better look at it. Um, but certainly we have boots on the ground and we have a 24-7 pollution hotline. Um, and we are pretty busy. Um, we triage the pollution incidents as they come in um, and we have a process to use our resources as efficiently as we can. So those of low severity, um, we would maybe triage them and say we will not go out until maybe the next day, but the high and medium, we go out um, immediately on those. So there is a process um, and we do have boots on the ground um, on all the pollution incidents, but um, the fine levels, is, as we described earlier, they're set and um, probably then it would be a case of taking further action to review those. Um, and as I said earlier, we will have further consideration of that. Tim, any additional comments? Yeah, there was just another point I forgot to add when we were talking about the levels of fines. Um, if uh, the pollution incident is caused by a farmer, uh, we will also undertake a cross-compliance inspection and there will be a breach penalty applied and quite often that's significantly more than the fines. Okay. Right, Claire. Listen, I want to maybe ask if I can as well. So, just in the business plan as a whole, um, you've stated that um, you're working on a, a set of reduced targets um, for this plan. Um, and I maybe want to just ask you a wee bit more about those. I, I know that you've mentioned COVID and Brexit in particular as two reasons why you're strategically targeting. Um, but I'm trying to link this in with the, the green growth strategy and also the environment bill that's coming forward and putting these all together. And I know that um, the committee, um, quite a number of us, have a lot of concerns around the fact that there is no non-regression clause in there. And, and uh, that we're being told by the minister, obviously, that you know nobody wants to um, implement any regressive measures. But if you're working on a set of reduced targets, and in the environment bill we don't have those specific protections and you're obviously working under different circumstances um with a, a priority here as well maybe any concerns yourself that um we will be looking at issues of non-regression i don't have any concerns of non-regression um clear on the basis that uh, there's the uk government have committed that the environmental legislation protections will stay in place the business plan has been directed this year because we need to use the resources we have in the smartest way possible and actually um, it reflects the fact that we do have to get um, completely into touch with the EU transition with the COVID-19 and with the green growth and moving forward so we said at the outset that this is a different business plan this year the same as the departments because we only have well we have 530 odd staff and we have to focus them so we've had to make a call on where to prioritize those staff to work on um, and that brought us into those three key areas of EU transition, the COVID, and then business as usual in terms of our statutory responsibilities. And then the targets you see after the first two are, are very much our statutory responsibilities, and we've highlighted those main ones that we absolutely need to do this year. But that doesn't mean to say that within the divisional plans there aren't other targets that we're actually setting out for the rest of the staff. This is just the, the key targets for the agency at the minute. Um, and we are confident that this is going to give us an appropriate level of, um, certainly on the regulation side, appropriate level of cover that we will be able to, to risk assess um, the way we will regulate um, and we will still be able to protect the environment and enhance it. And you can see there that we're still committed to do the actions on the rivers, we're still committed to do the action on the conservation management plans, we're still committed to do a very, um, as Rosemary said, quite a high profile issue around the planning process so we've had a long hard think about what are the big things that we need to tackle this year um, with the resources but ultimately it has to reflect the situation we're in and that is the exit from the EU and the pandemic um, and we've also built in contingency plans in and around our own thinking in terms of a second wave and what that might mean um, 
So we're also very conscious that you know it's a very moving picture this year, um, but this is it's, it's hopefully it reflects what we think we can do with okay. the resources we have. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Tracy. I will move round to William and have Morris after that. William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your presentation. In relation to planning, and as I mentioned earlier, um, some issues uh, I raised with uh, your David Small last day he was here, and there's an issue around farms that are not increasing. I have one guy with 35 cows, and he's re roofing his roof. He's doing nothing different, but still, no, NAA is beginning to jump through every hoop in the book, even though he's doing nothing different to what he actually has this last 20 years. Yeah. You know, he's not doing anything different. All he's doing is putting a roof on the shade that he already has there. And this is an issue for some people. I think it's an issue that seems to be that NAA is going over the top in relation to those situations. I can fully understand a new build and whether there's new emissions going to be, be uh, or emissions going to be possibly increased. But someone that is there and has had a specific herd of cows or animals for 20, 30 years and they only want to replace the roof, there seems to be an unfair level of bureaucracy uh, that they have to go through to get that sorted out? Well, I mean, I'm not going on that specific case, but hopefully the planning improvement plan that we've talked about will address that as well. But obviously also there's the issue of um, the ammonia action plan as well that the department's working on. Um, and we've had a several meetings with the minister on that, and we're working towards um, bringing forward an uh, ammonia action plan, which will include looking at um, the planning process that we are involved in, a statutory nature consultee. So there is work underway, William, on that, and I'm hoping that there'll be movement in that in the foreseeable future. You can understand where I'm coming from. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And Very you know, we understand completely where you're coming from, and it is a difficult issue that we've been working with this last while. Um, and we we want to we want to balance that whole protect the environment and, and help the farmers. There's no question about that. Um, it's just it's a it's a difficult situation, and we are working our way through it. But I recognise what you're saying, William. Absolutely. Okay. In relation to SAS, what communication between yourselves and SAS are the totally separate bodies, or is there some communication between the two? They're a totally separate body, but we are in engagement with them. Um, Helen's planning team do meet with SAS on a regular basis. Yeah. There we go. I have, a, I have situations where NAS is, is happy with an application. SAS then has some issues. Yeah. And that's not a good position for us to be in, and that's what we're trying to work our way through right now. Okay. Okay. I'm going to move around to Morris. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it's around uh, water quality, and in particular the lower ban. Uh, as we all know, every sea trout or salmon caught above two has to come through the lower ban, and I'm really concerned about the water quality of the lower ban, plus the indiscriminate release of water from the loch without any warning to the lower ban, which causes massive erosion, which again has a, an, an impact on, on the water quality. Is there any dialogue between yourselves and the Loss Commission about when they release water and at what particular time, so that it coincides with the outgoing tide in the Korean area? Okay, I'm going to have to pass that detailed question to Tim on the river ban. Great. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, okay. No, um, certainly the, the water pollution instance um, we, we've touched on before, and, and the, the, the ban is one of the, the rivers affected. And um, just going back to Claire's question, regulation enforcement alone isn't going to stop this. We need the behavioural change, so we need to communicate out those messages to farmers and to industry to do the right thing. And I'm, I'm talking about everybody as well, because some of our pollution incidents uh, in some of these areas are from NI water storm outfalls which are blocked by what people throw down the toilet. So there's responsibility on all of us to, to do the right thing around this. Um, we are working with um, Caffrey and Cass to put out some messages to farmers. We, we engage with them through the FAST newsletter on a water pollution incidents. We are targeting some of these sensitive areas with our enforcement activities and our educational activities. Uh, as regards the locks, locks agency, they control the levels of the lock. That's with them. It is something I think that would be part of the wider look at water reform and all the uh, abstractions and discharges. So I think that is a, a valid point that we look at as well. One we uh, go over. Next one. Uh, what measures have you in place to combat bank erosion from the release of extra water from Loch Ness, <coughs> along with the normal flood water? Sorry, I, I didn't catch the start what of that. What measures have you in place to, to combat bank erosion on the lower band? Coupled with the, the extra water that's released from Loch Ney and the normal flood water. 
I'm not sure I can answer you directly on that. I know that we have um, schemes where we go and support farmers to do planting on riverbanks, trees and so on as well in specific areas. Uh, and we work with uh, the um, Rivers Agency to, to identify what, what uh, we can do to support that. They will also look at those channels and rivers and put, it, put forward proposals to stop erosion. Um, but as I say, it, it is an area that needs looked at uh, holistically. So everything from the, the, the flows in the river to the abstractions and discharges. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Patsy Madlone, were you looking in there, Bay Jones? You Patsy, um, you're, yeah, you yeah, know what? I agree, I realise you're conscious of the pressures of time there. I could have broadened it out a wee bit further, but um, looking at the report, uh, could I ask those property agreements, or sorry, prosperity agreements, um, what have they delivered in terms of what what has been derived from them. Um, secondly, if I could ask then, uh, turnaround times from NIEA in terms of their consultations or uh, the consultations, planning consultations from the various councils, are there specific turnaround times for that? And then thirdly, I heard listened there to Tracy originally, whenever she was speaking, uh, she talked about innovative thinking and progressive ways. Um, could you give me a flavour of what, in essence, that, that means? Yep. Okay. Well, I'll, uh, prosperity agreements. I'll start off with Patsy, um, and and that links into part of the innovation of how we're going to do things or how we've planned to do things. Prosperity agreements in themselves have been a way to um, recognise people that we, companies, industries, businesses that we work with, who go beyond um, full compliance, who are seeking to really be exemplars in their field in terms of environmental compliance. Um, and we've entered into agreements with um, a range of organisations. Initially, it was kicked off with people that we regulate, but it has widened out. Um, so we have the likes of Coca-Cola, but we've also got Ucell, um, who we have a prosperity agreement with. And they're an agreement whereby um, we will say, you know, um, say you're, what are you going to do in terms of eliminating more waste in your company, uh, but greater resource efficiency in terms of how you use your resources. There's a whole raft of, of details in the agreements um, that we work with. Um, and the company signs up to those and we sign up to those and they're three years long. And then we monitor them um, and we will say, well, you know, did you achieve your, your outputs that you agreed? Now, they're private commercial agreements, but you know, they, they are work we have one with Dale Farm as well. Um, so they are innovative in that um, they're a commitment by ourselves and they're a commitment from the company to go above and beyond. Um, uh, and I, I think they're the way, way forward. I think they're a, a way beyond the stick of regulation. Um, there are companies who are normally progressive and who want to be doing more. And I think it fits in with the environment agenda that's now on the table. Um, in terms of, I'll keep on the innovation theme, some of the things we talked about earlier around um, how we're reorganising ourselves to carry out our inspections to carry out our um, monitoring and surveillance. We are looking at innovative ways. Um, we also have the regulatory transformation program, which is one of the targets in the business plan, which we decided to keep, because again, that's um, looking at delivering a better uh, service for our customer. Um, we are, I wouldn't say that the agency is top of the class in terms of um, having our services online. Um, so we need to get better at that, and that regulatory transformation programme that's in one of the targets is also a way that we want to be progressive and innovative. Um, on the targets then for planning, um, Helen, you look at the details on that? Yeah, so I think your specific question was around um, the different consultation times per council, if I, if I picked it up correctly. Yeah, and certainly, um, so in terms of, of the uh, the consultee responses that we provide. Um, it's not so much that it necessarily ferries by council. We'll have different numbers of applications of different types coming in from council. So this is some of the um, additional analysis that we've been doing this year. Looking, um, Some councils are more likely to send us larger numbers of particular types of applications. Um, and we're looking at our rate of response then in terms of going back to councils to see between us and them, are there things that we can learn there to um, better, inform, better inform that? And the point that was made, raised in terms of some applications actually being um, light in terms of detail and having to come in two or three times. So um, that's the sort of analysis that we're actually doing to better understand the 
number and types and quality of applications coming in and then the length of time that it's taken us to respond back out. Um, I don't have the breakdown by council with me today, but just looking last year, um, we had a 69% of applications were returned um, either within the 21 days or an extended agreed period. Um, but the average last year was actually 13 days. The average turnaround was 13 days, but that's cold comfort to somebody who's, who's waiting a lot longer than that. Um, you know, so um, some of the residency times that these are staying with the, depart with the department or with the agency aren't that long. But there are particular types of applications. So, for example, um, single dwellings is a good example. Um, some councils send us very high volume of single dwellings, but by and large, they might be low risk. So that's where we're trying to work with councils to determine um, if there are better ways that we can work together by providing better advice, better guidance, more, more stuff up front. Um, that's, I probably answered that in a very general way rather than, than perhaps a specific. Um, but if there's anything more detailed, if you want to come back to us, we'll come. We'll respond in writing. Okay, thanks very much for that, Helen. Um, just to get back to those uh, prosperity agreements, um, I'm, I'm a wee bit unsure of the the detail as to what they deliver. Uh, I, I can see the concept is probably is undoubtedly a good thing, but uh, I'm not quite sure there, uh, Tracy, just what what they're delivering. They will deliver different things, Patsy, depending on the company that we have signed up to. So there's no one size fits all. So we'll work with the company um, and look at what its business is and what way it carries out its business. And then we will agree with them um, what way they can excel in the environmental outcome field. So without using anyone in particular, for example, um, they might decide to use a different material that is recyclable from what they were using. They might decide to um, change the, the, the fuel that they're using in their company to reduce their CO2. There's different, um, without going into the specifics, there's different ways. Um, they might actually also, I know one um, company that we do have, they do an education theme for local children in the area on the theme of what their company is and how, um, how it operates and environmental uh, profile um, for the children. So it's without, without giving you, um, they're all different. They're all very different because of the nature of the business. But the idea behind them is that they will deliver improved that. outcomes. Who takes the initiative to uh, set up this prosperity agreement? Um, initially, they, so I, was, I was trying to explain there earlier that initially we would have uh, approached them through our regulatory role. Um, you know, if they were at full compliance and, and were um, doing everything that they were supposed to do, we would have had a conversation and they would be invited to have a discussion around prosperity agreements. But actually, more recently, people have been coming to us. So we have three in the pipeline, Patsy. Companies who we don't regulate have made approaches. Large companies have made approaches um, to have discussions with us about entering into prosperity agreement. Um, and again, I think it's a reflection of where the environment is in people's agenda. Um, and, and what they, they're coming to us to make sure that they're doing all they possibly can. A lot of companies are employing their own environmental manager. Um, and that's that they're coming to us and saying, could we have discussions with you about a prosperity agreement? Um, I'm happy actually to send you some of the guidance on it, Patsy, if that would be useful in terms yeah, of prosperity right. agreement and give you a wee bit better background. Okay, yeah. Chair, thanks very much for that. Okay, no problem. We need to move swiftly to the next session because we're into the slot with the Minister now, so we are. Okay. Um, so, um, Oh, sorry, what, what, sure, I was just going to say, and maybe um, for Morris, we'll give some more detail on his yeah. question um, because it was so specific and we didn't have the details. Um, appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. Very comprehensive briefing and very comprehensive answer. We really appreciate that. Sorry to rush us at the end, but we're, we're into the, the next slot with the with Minister and the Permanent Secretary. So thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you thank back you. again. Thank okay. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Just going to take a few minutes to clean, the, okay. clean down the tables. That's for um, cool air to be switched on. Or outside the door, no. Hmm? No water. No. Take it in. Get a glass and bring it in. You go out that door there. You wouldn't have to go out the front. It's warm, isn't it? There should be some in that long corridor, yeah. Is it far? I don't know. You don't have water. It's racing too. It's 
some members have gone to get a glass of water. Yeah, it's very warm. Hi, folks. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, a couple of members just went out to get yeah, last water. They're, they'll be back in again in a few moments. <laughs> um, so, take this opportunity to welcome the Minister, Minister Pouch, Thank you. Uh, Dr. McMahon, the Permanent Secretary, uh, Robert Huey <coughs> is here now too, the um, Deputy Secretary in Veterinary Animal Health, Rosemary Agnew, Grade 5, Brexit Director. And um, do we have, we have David? We have joined us. Do David Small join us by Starley? Is that right? He's, and Tracy? He's here, yeah. Tracy's Tracy. just left? Yeah, she's going upstairs to oh, right, one okay. of the rooms. So yeah. Tracy will be joining us in Starleaf now as well, and David Small, the Director, she's, Deputy she's Director, on. Environment, yeah. Marine and Fisheries Group. Okay. Um, I'd like to, uh, the Minister to make the opening remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Chairman, uh, and uh, glad of the opportunity to be here. Um, just to clarify, Rosemary has not joined the Alliance Party. She was given a sticker with that colour by, by the security staff. In case John, John gets excited here, so he does it. Sure, the meeting's not over yet. Well, not that I'm aware of. But stuff, but. Anyway, um, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to, to come to the committee. It's good to see Morris Bradley in the flesh again, you know. Still alive, Morris. So. Good to see you. And, uh, but thanks for the opportunity to come and. Uh, having a chat with you about um, our response to the COVID-19 pa pandemic, as well as providing an update on preparations for the, the new era ahead of us, as the UK reaches the end of its transitional arrangements and leaves the European Union. The vast majority of DERA staff now have the necessary IT equipment to allow them to work remotely, and with some exceptions, are settling into a new way of working. Most staff are reporting that they feel at least as productive as before the COVID <coughs> crisis. My department allocated its major response plan, emergency response plan on the 16th of March, uh, which remains in force. And the framework has enabled the department to inform decision makers, communicate to stakeholders, <coughs> and respond effectively to a wide range of COVID-19 challenges. And this work is ongoing to support our aim to recover better uh, from this emergency. So in April, I made a case uh, to the executive to help alleviate the emerging threat to farm business incomes due to falling farm gate prices and losses occurred within the ornamental horticulture sector triggered by COVID-19. Executive colleagues agreed to a £25 million financial support package on the 19th of May. I briefed this to the committee on the 22nd of May. What's your views on how the funding should be allocated? A new in turn requested stakeholder and industry input. So I want to say thanks for the contribution that uh, you made, received on the 11th of June, and has been very helpful in uh, us informing, uh, or informing us on, on the decisions that we ultimately made regarding the proposed uh, allocation of funding. I made a statement to the Assembly yesterday, a written statement, uh, advising members my decision to allocate £21.4 million to businesses in those sectors that have been hardest hit financially and those in most immediate need as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this resulted in an allocation of £7 million for beef, £11 million for dairy, £232,000 for sheep, and between £1.2 and £1.6 million for both the potato and ornamental horticulture sectors. And I believe this support will go a long way in helping businesses survive the current crisis. The allocation of funding has been based on evidence and distributed in an equitable way to those sectors that have clearly demonstrated tangible loss. In the coming weeks, I intend to bring forward legislation to the Assembly to enable the delivery of schemes that will provide the funding to farmers and growers. The COVID-19 support package is a contribution towards the losses incurred by the businesses as a result of short-term market disturbance. Since other HMG support measures are available to agriculture and horticulture businesses, rates of compensation for loss incurred have been set at 100 per cent or 80 per cent. Businesses in some sectors have been able to gain more support um, from those schemes than in other sectors. The 80 per cent rate is compatible with that set for the self-employed income support scheme and the amount of wages paid to furloughed workers through the coronavirus job retention scheme. The schemes being developed to support the sectors will follow similar design <coughs> principles to ensure good governance, avoid unnecessary bureaucracy, 
and ensure that the schemes comply with legal requirements, including state aid and Section 75. We cannot rule out the possibility of further market disturbance as a result of this pandemic and the need for farmer support. So, for that reason, I hope to use the residual funding of 3.6 million and a further 3.6 million that was reprioritised internally for potential allocations later in the year if additional issues arise. As a committee, we will be aware that COVID-19 restrictions were introduced in Northern Ireland just when the application period for the basic payment scheme was opening. I took the decision not to change the closing date for applications to ensure that full payments to farmers could be made in October. This will be a first for Northern Ireland farmers and ahead of every other part of the EU and UK. I am pleased to be able to say that I made the right decision. My department put in new process to, processes to ensure farmers' needs and received assistance when needed. Nearly 24,500 farmers had applied by the closing date, and this is more than last year, and fewer late applications were received. Inspections were paused in mid-March, but they are beginning again um, on a phased basis and aligned with PHA guidance. I know how important the basic payment is to farmers and the rural economy in general. And my officials are now working hard to ensure that the farmers get their full payments uh, in October. In addition to a successful basic payment application, I approved the opening of the fourth tranche of the Environmental Farming Scheme. I'm pleased to see a very healthy demand for the ind- from the industry for the support to help manage our most inv- important environmental sites. We received um, some 967 applications, highest number of applications in the scheme so far. And I approved the issue of letters of offer to successful applicants last week. Now I'd like uh, to update you on CAFRA. The department is planning for the delivery of education programmes at the College of Agriculture, Food and Rural Enterprise in September 2020. The safety and well-being of students and staff at CAFRA is my highest priority. And I wish to reassure prospective and returning students, their families and the wider community that the delivery of education programmes will be managed to ensure that we adhere to the prevailing public health agency protocols and government guidelines. A blended approach will be used to deliver the programmes with face-to-face delivery for all the practical elements of the programmes, combined with remote learning for lectures where appropriate using digital learning technologies. This approach will ensure that students will continue to be provided with the practical learning opportunities, which are a unique feature of all our vocational programmes at Greenmount, Lockery and Enniskillen campuses. CAFRI's Knowledge Advisory Service, Advisors and Technologists, continue to provide advisory support to the Northern Ireland agri-food industry to assist farmers and food businesses with technical business and environmental advice, and a similar blended approach to the delivery of schemes and programmes is being developed to ensure the continued delivery of a professional and quality service to the agri-food industry. Throughout this pandemic, my department has worked closely with local councils and the wider waste industry to ensure that vital household waste collection services were maintained, and the flow of crucial materials continued through the supply chain. While councils initially took the decision to close our household waste recycling centres, many of these have now reopened, with the majority accepting the full range of waste types. My officials have also continued to work closely with Northern Ireland Water to ensure the effective regulation of drinking water and wastewater throughout the COVID-19 response period. Throughout this time, while many routine monitoring and inspections were paused, our 24-7 pollution response continued and an increased priority was given to monitoring and surveillance of drinking water catchments and sensitive sites to protect drinking water supplies. As we move into the recovery period, routine inspections, monitoring and surveillance are gradually being phased back in. Site inspections at waste <coughs> waste licensed facilities resumed on the 5th of June 2020, and capacity will increase over the coming days and weeks. No, Sampling of rivers and in drinking water protected areas has also recommenced with farm inspections to prevent or identify any pollution issues. We have also reopened facilities at the forest and country parks as a further step to aid recovery and provide a more complete experience for people visiting these fantastic outdoor venues. I recognise that the fishing industry has been significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, I provide a total funding of up to £1.9 million (coughs) to support the sea fish catching and aquaculture sectors at this very challenging time. The sea fish catching scheme has paid out over £1.3 million to 168 commercial fishing vessel owners, depending on fishing for their primary income. 
I have launched work to develop a green growth strategy for Northern Ireland and to help tackle environmental and climate change challenges and fulfil commitments contained within the draft programme for government and New Decade New Approach deal. It is important that we seize the opportunity presented by the COVID-19 crisis and by taking a green growth approach make real and long-lasting linkages between the private sector and the public sector and indeed the people to help us achieve a total generational shift in how we approach our economy and our environment. In June, I launched a revised forest expansion grant scheme for the next stage of the Forest for Our Future programme. <coughs> the scheme aims to encourage and help landowners plant their own woodland. In relation to the Department's Tackling Rural Poverty and Social Isolation programme, at the outset of the coronavirus crisis, I worked with officials to ensure they refocused TRIPSI initiatives were possible to assist the most vulnerable and to implement the necessary relaxations to ensure those businesses and community and voluntary sector organisations received the TRIPSI grant aid funding that they were entitled to. I also provide, provided £250,000 of TRIPSI financial assistance to the Community Foundation Northern Ireland Coronavirus Community Fund. This fund offered an efficient and practical way to very quickly provide grant aid the community and voluntary sector who had swiftly organised themselves to deliver services in the locality to those in need of support. To date, 154 rural organisations have received a total of £434,000 grant, some 74 of which have been funded from my department's contribution. Also, 13 faith-based organisations, seven of which are rural, rural, whose applications were deemed ineligible by CFNI, have now received over £21,000 grant aid through a partnership arrangement between my department, the Department for Communities and Rural Community Network. I recently visited two of these organisations and was inspired by the work they undertook for their local communities during a very difficult time. I should say that is purely because the rules of CFNI is not that they do not uh, support faith-based organisations. <coughs> As you are aware, the TRIPSI framework provides opportunities to work collaborating uh, across departments, agencies, public bodies and the community and voluntary sector, and allows a flexible approach to be implemented as required. The outbreak of the COVID-19 virus brought these opportunities to the fore. For example, by working in partnership with DFI, we were quickly able to refocus the work that the Rural Community Transport Partnerships undertake to utilise their staff and vehicles to play a key role working in tandem with councils and health trusts to deliver food and other essential services to those rural dwellers who were shielding and vulnerable. Their work <coughs> in this area is ongoing, and up to the end of May, 10,500 food parcels were delivered to individual households by the community transport operators, and another 8,200 delivered to the distribution hubs for onward supply to those entitled to this help. I also authorised my department's forestry service staff and vehicles to assist the hubs with delivery work. Feedback from councils has been very positive about the crucial role those partners played in delivering critical services. Across a range of initiatives, such as the Social Prescribing Project, the Farm Families Health Checks Programme, the Assisted Rural Travel Scheme, direct contact was made with over 16,500, from which 8,500 received crucial assistance. <clears throat> the Rural Support Networks we were contracted by my department through the TRIPSI programme to deliver the Rural Community Development Support Service continues to play a pivotal role in assisting councils and health trusts with the task of identifying those vulnerable rural residents who are in need of assistance and coordinating the community response to ensure that it is delivered in a structured way. They have liaised with and supported over 1,500 local community groups through the COVID-19 lockdown and have also sourced and distributed food parcels to those not in the shielded group, who are experiencing financial hardship, and have also sourced <coughs> and delivered PPE and hand sanitizer for frontline groups. This work involved very practical but essential activities. The Rural Support Charity has also been extremely busy during the crisis, dealing with an increase in calls of over 200 per cent from anxious farmers and farm family members. I ensured rural support were adequately resourced, supported to deal with a significant increase in calls. I thank them and all of the other partners who really stepped up to the mark to support the most vulnerable during the pandemic. I mentioned earlier the relaxations that were introduced in March to ensure grant aid flowed to those entitled. 
As a result, <coughs> almost £1 million of TRIPSI grant aid has been paid out to date to 588 community and voluntary organisations and small businesses. I am very aware that this has had a very positive impact on the ground during those times <coughs> of extreme need. <coughs> Regarding the TRIPSI programme, I have secured a £5.5 million budget for this financial year. These finances will support a range of existing poverty and social isolation initiatives and, very importantly, will help to address specific rural issues that will come to the fore as the reverberations of the COVID-19 pandemic becomes apparent. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, officials have provided a number of easements in line with the flexibilities contained in the EU Commission guidance to the local action groups and councils to ensure that project promoters can continue to be reimbursed in a timely manner without the full checks being carried out in advance. So while all capital works had ceased due to COVID-19 restrictions, officials have been advised that many contractors are now back or planning to go back on site. EU funding programmes have played a key role in sustaining and developing rural communities for over 35 years. It is clear <coughs> from engagement between officials and stakeholders that there remains a need to support rural businesses and communities going forward. Officials are currently working on the development of a rural policy framework to continue to support rural communities <coughs> beyond the current, <coughs> excuse me, the current EU-funded rural development programme. <coughs> the framework will go out to public consultation in the summer. In terms of dear direct offices, like most public-facing government buildings, they have been closed to the public as part of the coronavirus lockdown. However, farmers have been able to conduct their business through dear online services the Deer Cattle Registration Telephony Line or delivery documents to the Deer Direct Post Box located at the entrance to the buildings. Although recovery plans are currently being developed to allow more staff and in due course Deer customers to return to the offices, it should be pointed out that the front counter facilities are only a small part of the service provided in the Deer Direct offices. Back office processing has continued uninterrupted throughout the crisis and staff have continued to deliver excellent customer service. For example, during April and May, crucial work in relation to the food supply chain, including over 1,800 export health certificates, processed around 23,500 calves, registered <coughs> over 56,000 farm-to-farm movements for cattle and 24,500 for sheep, processed while 5,400 TB and BR tests were completed. In addition, the 1,065 digital assistance telephone calls were facilitated, with a further 5,500 SAF-related queries fielded. During April, the completion of the complex EFS map, edited by local office staff, allowed an additional £517,387 in funding to be released to the farming community at this very difficult time. Thankfully, some of the negative impacts that were anticipated during the pandemic have not surfaced. We have not experienced a significant loss of productions in our abattoirs, for example. Markets did stop, <coughs> but quickly resumed, so all the forecasts of livestock being backed up on farms, unable to be slaughtered, thankfully never came to pass. This is due to the hard work and resilience of key workers in our meat plants, the dedication and flexibility of, of my own officials, as well as the endeavours of farmers and market operators. Each and every one of these key workers deserves our gratitude and appreciation as they kept food on our shelves. The pandemic has, of course, raised issues around the safety of key workers in our meat plants. From the outset, my officials have been working closely with the representative industry bodies, individual food business operators, Food Standard Agency, Northern Ireland Health and Safety Executive, the Public Health Agency, and indeed the trade unions, to ensure a safe and hygienic working environment for all personnel at meat plants and minimise the risk of COVID-19 transmission there. Frequent and often daily meetings have been held, and they provided an opportunity for industry to engage with the Public Health Agency and other officials with regard to COVID-19 testing strategy. The development of site-specific risk assessments, control strategies, testing protocols, contact tracing, and access to testing. My officials continue to monitor the position at meat plants and keep me appraised of any new developments. Despite the ongoing challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic, I am pleased to report that my teams have worked hard to ensure veterinary export certification is being delivered by the Department as normal to support the Northern Ireland agri-food industry. 
ongoing certification is required for exports to third countries and for live animals to TB and the EU. I recognise the importance of access to new markets at this time. <clears throat> the Department continues to progress other market access work, again within the challenging context of the global resourcing and public health guidance arising from COVID-19. Officials are continuing to work with industry, AFPE, DEFRA and other government departments to ensure that the export of beef from Northern Ireland to the USA and China can commence as soon as possible. I am also pleased to report that our TB testing programme has continued during the pandemic. I have issued TB testing guidance on three separate occasions as the situation developed with the health and well-being of farm families and testing veterinarians guiding our decisions. The most recent guidance, which was issued at the end of April, brought in a number of measures to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on the ability of our farm businesses to continue to trade. It also provided for calves under 180 days to be exempt from TB tests where social distancing cannot be maintained. Feedback from farmers, vets and other jurisdictions has indicated that the handling of younger bovines had been the biggest obstacle to safe social distancing during a TB skin test. I am pleased to report that since the revised guidance was introduced, the number of TB herd tests being undertaken have returned to levels expected for this time of the year. The position with regard to TB testing throughout the UK is being kept under review as the situation develops, and my officials are in close contact with the local farmers' union and veterinary associations, along with colleagues in DEFRA and the Republic of Ireland. In March, in order to protect the health of farm families, and my staff um, suspended um, the routine on-farm animal disease surveillance and testing programme. And this included um, brucellosis sampling of cattle, post-import sampling of GB sheep for Medivisna, and the scraping monitoring scheme. However, this reduction is on-farm surveillance was mitigated by continued anti-mortem and post-mortem surveillance of all animals and slaughter plants, surveillance by staff at ports and airports, and maintaining movement restrictions on imported animals until sampling and testing was able to be completed. Throughout this pandemic, veterinary staff have continued to investigate any cases of suspected epizootic diseases or brucellosis on farm. Likewise, salmonella investigations and post-import testing for blue tongue and swine fever has not stopped. The Department remains vigilant against the threats posed by serious animal disease incursions into Northern Ireland. Departmental vets and inspectors are now resuming their full range of disease sur surveillance and testing duties on farm, and some three months after the pausing of many routine duties, I welcome this gradual return to normal service. Since the onset of the pandemic, <coughs> I am conscious that members have expressed an interest in how the COVID restrictions have affected animal welfare, and I am very aware that People have been unable to do things with or, or, or for their companion animals, which they previously took for granted. This included simple pleasures like taking the dog to the groomers or being able to raise pigeons. I hope show members in the public that have been able to listen to people's needs and make the case for safe evidence-based easements to lockdown restrictions. For example, I was able to make the case to executive colleagues for the need for a clause to permit individuals to travel to ensure or promote animal welfare. This simple but far-reaching amendment enabled companion animal owners to access non-veterinary care service um, or restart training outdoors. This helped not just the dog groomers, but the pet physiotherapists, hydrotherapists and other animal care providers get back to work. As I have already alluded to, um, my, by listening to fellow MLAs and members of the many clubs across Northern Ireland, I been able to sanction the resumption of socially distant pigeon racing, which has provided a welcome return to normal, normality. For those enthusiasts. In addition, <coughs> this same amendment has given animal welfare charities the necessary legal cover to recommence their activities. For example, rescue and rehoming of vulnerable animals is up and running once again, with centres taking the necessary precautions to mitigate risk for prospective pet owners, staff, and volunteers. Also, been delighted to announce that zoos and similar businesses are free to operate again from the 3rd of July. I am aware that due to the previous necessary restrictions, these businesses and their animals were facing very uncertain times. However, they will now be able to commence bookings, plan for visitors, and most importantly, generate income to look after the animals. Not only will the reopening of these businesses help provide them with much needed financial stability, it will also be a move towards restoring a sense of normality, which can dramatically improve general well being for the public. However, I must stress that I have only been able to implement these easements because the public have shown restraint and acted responsibly, and I would like to thank and commend them for that. But in order to keep those easements in place, 
and unlock the door to further relaxation, the public must continue to play their part in maintaining vigilance and reducing COVID-19 risk for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for allowing me to make these opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Pitch, for that. Uh, a number of members who want to ask questions, but I suppose I will start off. Um, and uh, I just want to draw your attention to the the twenty five million pound. Obviously, this is a source of huge uh, interest to the um, the wider uh, community in terms of the agri-food and the uh, the um, um, horticulture sectors and sheep sector as well. And uh, obviously, in the announcement you made yesterday, you know, I'm just drawn on the allocation of that there. Um, certainly, I would have a concern. Um, spoken to a lot of hill farmers who feel that who, who have been overlooked for this funding. Uh, the the funding is uh, from the farming sector has been directed towards the finishers and towards the dairy sector. But we do have a situation where our primary producers um, who have suffered losses as well. Um, and indeed, the report you would have received through the Anderson Centre have indicated that there has been losses in those sectors throughout the course of the pandemic. And through EFIS, there's been quite a number of 22,000 farm to farm moves during the month of April when the, the march were closed. <coughs> but yet, this sector does, has not been included in the funding announcement and is causing a great deal of disappointment. And I just wondered if you have any plans to revisit this particular sector, and which is, I have to say, is mostly our hill farmers. Yeah, I, I didn't choose to visit any sector per se. Um, I <coughs> asked for people to reduce evidence of losses, and it was not basis that we made the allocations. Um, so there were some sectors which was very easy and, and clear to do, and, and I'll say this. There will always be someone who is disappointed um, whenever funding is handed out because we cannot, you just can't put a net so wide that it will reach every individual. Um, however, the, the beef finishers, when they finish their stock, go out and buy more stock. And if they have had bad prices for the finishing, then that is generally reflected in, in the prices that, that they will acquire stock at. If the prices have been better, then generally the prices for the, the primary producer is better. And uh, I believe that that will be reflected. The fact that the support that we have given to the beef finishers will be reflected for the primary producers whenever it comes to the, the autumn um, calf sales, uh, when most of the hill farmers actually take their produce out. Um, in the main, hill farmers tend to, to, to calve in the springtime and sell in the autumn time. Um, as opposed to selling in the springtime. So I, I believe that we, we, we have supported them in a way, even though it's not direct, because the, the beef finisher will, 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 will pass that on whenever they, they're actually um, acquiring. I suppose the other aspect <coughs> of it is that we, we, you know, there will be people in less favoured areas who engage in beef finishing. Um, and also, we provided support for the sheep during that period, um, whenever they actually were losing uh, money, and, and that was what was identifiable. So, it, it wasn't sectoral based; it was based on where people who could, could provide the evidence of loss. And I think it's very important that we did hold something back, because we recognise that there could be a flush of lambs, and there could be a flush of cattle come on the market. And that will have an impact upon lamb prices and could have an impact upon sucker calf prices. But we will be in a position to respond to that um, with a further tranche of money. So uh, they may not have been the ones who, who got it directly this time, um, but that will not preclude uh, them with a further seven million. Um, it depends just how things pan out. So we we'll have held money back. And that is in mind, and holding that money back, that it is not, <coughs> it is not uh, being allocated again for, for, for those who have necessarily benefited already. It will be allocated on the basis of need, so further loss will demonstrate uh, where that money goes. Um, which uh, probably led me on to my second question. You know, the, 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 again, in, in general terms, the, 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 the primary producers, and certainly in terms of beef and sheep, there's 10,000 or the 20,000 
producers and there's only 25,000 farmers in the north. Uh, 10,000 of them are, would be in areas that are designated as ANC and they're by and large, not exclusive, but by and large primary producers. So there's a huge, there are a huge, huge chunk of the agri-food industry, uh, you know, the, these primary producers. And I have to say, you know, they have endured suffering over the course of the COVID crisis. You know, the, the input costs, uh, as you will be aware, have increased for fertiliser and for um, for feed. And, uh, and indeed, they're coping with the COVID crisis. Some of them actually experienced the COVID themselves, uh, as well as the loss of price because they were forced to sell their cattle uh, between farms because the marts were closed and, and they, they are extremely disappointed that that does not seem to have been factored into the equation. So that's that's supposed to be my next question actually, is that is this something that you may consider uh, either going back to the executive and looking for additional funding or uh, looking at how that £7 million may be allocated to support the challenges that these farmers are facing? Well, <coughs> number one, <coughs> number one, I'm happy to go back to the executive. Um, we be able to demonstrate that, that there is a need, um, so willing to do that. Um, we augment the seven million that we'll have in reserve. So I, I'm happy to look at this. Um, no intention of, of discriminating against any sector, um, but we are we do operate under under rules, guidance, and state aid rules. So, for example, broiler breeders. Um, we, we, we believe that they are going to sustain a loss, um, as already the, the chickens are out for longer periods of time, um, the hens aren't being allowed to, to do their full cycle, um, because <clears throat> there's been a big reduction in demand for the broiler breeder eggs, and those farmers will, over a period, um, receive loss as a consequence of COVID-19. But we couldn't understated rules give them money because that was for loss that, that we're anticipating. It has to be on the basis of what has happened. Uh, so we're very happy to look back on what has happened and that's one of the reasons that we kept something in reserve. So we didn't have to go back to the executive again. Um, there's something there um, we haven't allocated at all. And if the people you know that you're referring to can demonstrate loss over that period of time, very happy to look at it. Okay, well, I'll take our opportunity to move around the room. Um, have Philip be indicated once more? Thank you. Uh, I mean, before I ask the question, I suppose that was a very comprehensive report, and there's, there's an awful lot that's very positive and good on there. And I mean, I don't know, I can't, I can't remember if I thank the Minister and officials for the work that they've done during uh, the very difficult circumstances of COVID. And I mean, you detailed an awful lot of good work there. Yeah. Uh, and working with others in the industry to ensure we've hit food and, and that the money and assistance was given particularly to our vulnerable rural communities. Yeah. So I think it's important uh, that uh, I record my thanks. Uh, just kind of following on from the question to the chair, because I mean, the, the, kind of the big issue of the day is the 25 million. And uh, I mean, I think that it's good that we've got 25 million to assist those in the industry. That, that, that's certainly welcome, and it's also welcome that uh, it, it seems the position now is a, is a bit more expansive than maybe initially was the case, and, and others within the, the agri sector are, are getting some of this money. But just I would express the same disappointment that it hasn't went far enough. I mean, I, I represent a constituency where there's a, a heavy reliance on agriculture, and I mean there's. <coughs> Two million odd sheep in the north, and uh, from figures I've extrapolated, there, there, there potentially is between 400 and 500,000 uh, across the council areas that that I represent, uh, and a lot of those people who own sheep are disappointed. Some of them uh, ha ha are sheep farmers, but also uh, beef farmers as yeah. well, and, and so they're doubly disappointed. They're they're struggling to make a living. The chair has pointed out that. Uh, you know, most of this money is going to the the finishers as opposed to the primary producers, and, and he has alluded to circumstances where during this crisis, you know, there there was movement of sheep and beef between farms, and money has been lost as a result of that. I'm not sure I accept your uh, your extrapolation that by given to the the. Uh, finishers that that will then compensate at a further date for the the. Uh, 
primary producers. I, I would maybe suspect that there's every chance that it, it, it'll help those uh, within the, the uh, abattoirs, etc., within that industry. Uh, so, I mean, I, I do think I'm disappointed that that is. I mean, I would share the chair's concerns, and I would ask the minister maybe look at it. I mean, for example, I'm aware that you know you've had correspondence recently from uh, sheep farmers in relation to the, the collapse in the wool market, and I mean, I'm not sure if, if there's any consideration uh, that. I mean, the figure of 232,000 compared to the 11 million for dairy farmers and 7 million for beef. I mean, I, I, I would conclude is a bit derisory. Uh, so I, I would like that uh, expanded upon, and I, I do think the minister need to look at those. Who I know you want evidence, but I mean there is there is evidence there uh, from secondary sources that other farmers who haven't aren't going to benefit from, from this have lost out as a result of the COVID crisis. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I understand that. Um, however, we we done it on on the basis of the evidence that was provided, and you know. In terms of the scheme design principles, I'll read them out for you because basically I, I, I set the officials a task and I accepted um, what they came back with uh, <clears throat> in, in terms of their recommendations. Support for evidence based losses caused by market disturbance, um, target support to those impacted most financially, compliance with state aid rules, simple and flexible to administer with minimum bureaucracy. No negative impact on administration of the basic payment funding. To comply with good governance and accountability. Avoid overcompensation of losses and consider those benefits gained from other HMD schemes. Partnership approach with stakeholders and comply with Section 75 obligations. That was <coughs> that was the scheme design principles, and you know that's the outcome of, of, of it. Um, and I believe that it has been very targeted to those who, who suffered the biggest losses. In the midst of all of that, you know, we did do the environmental farming scheme, and uh, there was um, 260 letters of offer have went out on the, on the back of that um, to farms which are entirely, in a, you know, in, in less favoured areas. Um, so these are farms um, which are in SPAs, SCAs, or, or, or Ramsars. Um, so. There is a course of funding which is going entirely to, to one sector. Um, I don't have any issue with that, because that's what that was targeted to do, uh, and that, that's that, that, that's how it is. So, <clears throat> I'm just saying that by way of there is some things where we'll be weighted more towards um, one area, one we weighted more towards the other. It's based on the facts that are presented to us in, in the instance of the environmental farming scheme. Those are the more environmentally sensitive areas. Uh, those who were hit hardest by, by the markets were those who were supplying directly. Um, and when the hospitality sector closed down, those were the people who got hit the hardest. So it's just the nature of it. Um, there's <coughs> nothing in it um, as to one sector or anything else. It is just providing support to people who actually took losses. Right. Not right. Uh, do you mean just. Uh, quick, I mean, because I, I don't have any difficulty with the, uh, the stipulation and the rules of, of the scheme. I mean, I do think that some of the things that we have said would actually fit in with with those guidance. Uh, <coughs> and I mean, we're not asking for specific target towards sectors. We're just asking for it to be spread further within various sectors. I, I think is the, the argument. I mean, I, I mean, the chair has pointed out that you know those twenty thousand odd cattle shifted between farms during this period at loss. So, I mean, th there is evidence beyond the, the evidence of uh, market prices where you know farmers have lost as a result of it, and there's, they're not getting any compensation. I would also add that if an individual sold animals to someone who then took them to the factory, um, it is the person who was had held the animals for at least 30 days that gets the payment. Um, so it's not the middle the middleman as such um, who, who would be getting the payment. It will be the, the, the primary producer in that instance. The same applies for sheep. And it accounts also for the sheep that was slaughtered in the south of Ireland, not just not just here, because a lot of them go that direction. Thank you, uh, Mr. Okefop. Um Harry. Thank you, Chair and uh, Minister. You said that before the end of June, 
you'll have made a final decision on your allocation of funding and that it will be administered with ease and at pace. Have you managed to do that? Yeah, well, we're just about, <laughs> we're just about scraped into the end of June. Yep. Um, but nonetheless, we've done it. Um, and you know, we could have done it sooner. Um, but we sought to gather as much evidence as possible, so it was evidence-based. Uh, so, in that respect, uh, yes. In terms of the distribution of it, um, I'm going to let Dennis or Rosemary respond to that, because <coughs> they, have, they have been working up how it has to be done. Um, I would hope that August will be a, a positive month in that, in that front, but I'll let Rosemary okay. talk a little bit on okay. um, well, first and foremost, we will require some legislation to enable us to pay it. So there will be um, some SRs come forward to the committee um, and we would um, ask for your indulgence in trying to move those through as quickly as possible across those various sectors. I'm not yet clear and we aren't yet clear whether we will need different pieces of legislation for dairy, for, uh, for beef, sheep, etc., or whether it will be one, piece, one jumbo SR. Um, but we hope to be able to provide clarity on that as soon as possible. In terms of making the payment in August, we do have plans um, already in place um, to try to enable those payments to be made, but the legislation has to come first, and the current plan is that the payments would be made in August. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, hi. Um, Rosemary? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Minister Toon. I do welcome your statement. Although I will have a few harsh words to say. Again, I am <laughs> disappointed with the uh, suckler farmer, the primary beef producer, primary producers actually. Again, like like it's been already um, said, uh, many of these people have suffered losses because these these animals were sold and there were no marts open, <coughs> and they were sold sort of between two people doing a deal, etc., etc., And I do think there were losses there, losses made there. Also, it will be no surprise to you that I've been contacted by a number of broiler farmers coming from South Tyrone, and they also have expressed disappointment and not been included. But hopefully you still have a, some, some monies left in the bank and hopefully you will uh, try and yep. see what you can do for them before the times for the for too long. So that's that's the first thing I want to make a comment on. The sec the second thing I want to you talked about the blended approach for Caffrey for conducting some of the work in September from yep. Caffrey. Um, that's that's all all very well. Some of this blended approach, I'm sure, is going to use broadband, and it's not very blended when you get into the very rural areas of Fermanagh. Yeah. So, is there any <coughs> have you have you any plans to try and hurry this issue with broadband up? Okay. I, I know it has been out to tender, etc., yeah. etc., and maybe. Maybe encourage to start looking at the rural areas rather than the non-rural areas. Start well, there. Well, start start at the last project. Stratum is is out for tender, yeah. and you know I find all of these things equally as frustrating as as, as the members. Um, the money's there. Just get it out. But we do have to go through process. Uh, uh, that's that will meet all of the, the auditing and so forth, and. Um, Hopefully that will come to a conclusion soon. I should say that um, the colleges, I hope, will be able to have a lot of activity at the colleges. Mm. And I think the colleges would like that. They're observing what's happening in terms of COVID-19. You know, the, the numbers are well down in terms of, of, of the individuals who have COVID-19. And the risk as a consequence is well down. And as a result, the executive have relaxed <coughs> Do you need to be careful? The risk hasn't gone away. Remember, this started off with one person getting a bus or a train from uh, Dublin back up here. So, if there's somewhere up to a thousand people who still have it, 
then there's still a considerable level of risk. So we do need to, to keep um, that R figure well down. It may, may have a rise to more than one, but it can't rise to a lot more than one, otherwise you'll start to hit problems very quickly. So we do need to be cautious going forward. However, <coughs> there are so many of the, cor of the, the courses and of the work that will be done um, at our colleges that in reality you will learn so much more practical hands-on and therefore we want to get as many students back to the colleges as possible and all of that will be done on, on a risk-based uh, assessment. Uh, so I recognise what you say in, in particular about the broadband, whether young people would have to go in and use local libraries mm -hmm. or, or other facilities, which is a nuisance in itself. Um, and I don't believe that you get the same quality of learning, either in the, the school sector or, or in the further education sector, um, not, not, not actually at the facility. Um, so we will be encouraging as much as possible to take place come September. Um, and I take note of what you say about the, 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 on the first comments, and there's a bit in the piggy bank left, so if, if that's demonstrated the, of, of loss there, then we're very happy to look at that. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I go yep. expand a little? Um, during the summer, I'm sure you have been aware that throughout the past number of years, there has been, I call it a young, young tractor handlers course, but yep. for young people, these 14, 15, 16 year olds in colleges in Caffrey. I'm sure that that will not be going on this year. I know it takes place outside and yep. et cetera, et cetera, and it's, it'll, it's I'm not sure whether that particular course is taking place. I can find that out for you. Um, but I would say that we'll have, I have to say, we'll have very impressive people um, managing our colleges, and they are not people who are going to be defeated easily mm -hmm. uh, in delivering good quality education um, for young people who are coming to our colleges. And they're going to look at ways forward and innovative ways of doing things to ensure that the quality of education is not diminished in any way. I've said we have some excellent young people um, leaving our facilities, um, and the, the numbers of them that are getting jobs is tremendous. So, you know, the colleges, the, the service that is delivered through CAFRE is a service that delivers many people into good quality jobs um, thereafter, and CAFRE offers a, a tremendous service. Yeah. No, I th think that particular course, that young tractor handling course, it actually sets young people. It makes it increases their awareness of the dangers yeah. that there are, and, and it's aimed at your 14, 16, you know, that age group rather than yeah. your 17, 18 year olds. I think it's an excellent course. And the last thing I want to ask about is reprofiled money. <coughs> you took 1.3 million was reprofiled. Uh, coronavirus support money going to councils for waste. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, um, a lot of the councils actually received additional waste as a result of COVID-19. Yeah. So previously they would have been getting a lot of waste through the commercial sector, through the restaurants and all of that there. So there's more waste at home because people were cooking more at home, um, more packaging obviously. And then as well as that, you know how it is when you're in the house and you've nothing to do um, and you start spring cleaning. So the, our, our, a lot of additional waste was received, um, both um, black bin and blue bin. Um, so that, that, that came at a cost to, to local government. There has been a, a piece of work done identifying the additional waste handled by each, each um, local council area. So there is um, definitive figures um, of actual waste, additional waste w that was received, and we're looking to see how we can support them on the basis of, of the waste handled. <laughs> so it's not about the council or the council size, it's about the actual material handled. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Patsy, we'll go online to Patsy here. Patsy. Minister. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Are we online? Yeah. We hear you. Yeah, we're good. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Minister, uh, for your announcement there today. Very welcome by a lot of people who were the, the producers who did 
just to steal losses and the sales of their of the uh, animals that they had. And um, that's good to hear and very welcome news. Um, could I just ask, um, there's a number of things Rosemary has touched on the rural broadband. I don't need to uh, recite that all over again. Um, the, the, it's, a, it's a huge requirement for businesses, uh, for school, for people working at home and for school teachers and pupils and the social connection, particularly for older people. And uh, I think you're, you're in line with that. But could I ask you just, um, there's been a lot of talk there about the support for farmers. Um, I live very close to Loch Ney <clears throat> and quite a few fishermen, uh, that's eel fishermen on the loch, have been in touch to ask about, is there any form of support that could be provided to them? <clears throat> and then um, there's there's another issue, and I heard you referring to it, I was glad to hear that. Um, that's the whole question of safety of workers and meat plants, uh, because um, meat plants internationally, um, whether it's in the United States, Canada, uh, Germany, and Spain, and indeed in the UK, have been a hotbed of outbreaks of COVID, some of them pretty extensive. And including in Germany, where I think maybe there's 1,300 in one um, meat factory, meat processing factory, had had a, a severe outbreak. So um, could you maybe give us some indication of the intensity of involvement of people from, um, in particular, the department, uh, how they tick tack with the likes of the HSE, and uh, do, in fact, they make unannounced visits to these meat plants? Well, Thank you. Uh, in terms of our staff, they're in the meat plants all of the time. Um, the veterinary inspectors, because they are always looking at the assessment um, of what's going on, um, so that the standards um, can be sustained and an evidential basis there uh, for those who are exporting foods. Uh, so that, that is something that we, we do, and the expertise that, that exists amongst our veterinarians is is very high in, in, in terms of science uh, in general, veterinary science in particular, but science in general. And consequently, they have offered much of that expertise uh, in terms of supporting uh, meat plants, in terms of challenging meat plants um, of their needs uh, to respond uh, to the workers. So, in many circumstances, the workers are working very close together, um, certainly considerably less than, than two metres, in some instances, probably less than one. Uh, but there has been a considerable effort made by many of them. Um, in the erection of perspex, uh, in providing uh, PPE, <clears throat> and also um, many of them have uh, been doing a lot of testing. So we have had problems, um, but we haven't had problems on the scale of some other places. And that is something that we continue to need to be on top of, um, because I think as we look going forward in COVID, you look at the situation in Leicester, and the suggestion that there could be 25 further um, cities and towns in England um, where there could be hotspots. Uh, we need to be cautious about the hotspots. Um, the health minister was saying that last week, in total, I think there was 21 new cases. Uh, but on Monday, we had 10 new cases. So we <coughs> just need to be cautious. You know, th these numbers are very low. But if they start going upwards, then they can they can uh, extrapolate very very quickly. So uh, that caution needs to happen. The meat plants are a place that we need to be very cautious in. I, I will pay particular credit to Brian Duher who led, led on this issue uh, for us, and he has done tremendous work uh, in supporting the meat plants, in supporting the workers in the meat plants, and uh, you know using the skills and knowledge of, of, of his staff. In terms of the Loch Ness eels, as with some of the other issues, and we were able to support uh, the sea fisheries quite quickly, and indeed aquaculture, Loch Ness eels was slightly more difficult in that their markets only really kick off um, as we get into the, the summer and, 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 and June, June, basically, onwards. So that evidence base that we require to, to backdate payments uh, is starting to creep in. Um, so we're in a better position now uh, to do something and to look at something um, with the Loch Ness eel fisheries. So that is a course of work that we're currently doing. Um, we have officials looking at that. 
and I'm not sure if David um, wants to add anything in terms of the the, the, the eel fisheries. David Small. Where is David? Online. You look David? very comfortable there, Patsy. By the way, <laughs> I'm, 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 some, I'm somewhat envious. <laughs> David online, isn't it? Right? <laughs> it was. Yeah. Yeah. Bring him in. If you call him that thing. David, can we? Can you come in there? Hear me, Chairman. Yes. yes. Yeah, so the, the only thing I would add is that we, we have been working with the Loch Ney, uh Fishermen's Co-op and as the Minister says, that, that work is around trying to put together the data and the evidence that we need to determine, first of all, what the, the, the nature of the challenges were, the, the need for support and if we're clear on that then we have you know, we have a mechanism through which we could offer some support through the EMFF but we're st as the minister says we're still we're still working on that so there's further work to do okay thanks very much indeed for that and uh, well we'll have done some work with Lochney co-op there's other producers there other uh, fish producers around the lock who maybe aren't commercially attached to the to the fishermen's co-op so I'd ask maybe just you would have a a look at that. Um, just one other follow-up, if I could, Minister, with you, is um, particularly around a lot to get back to the meat processing plants. Um, as you will know, um, a lot of the people who are working in them would be newcomers to 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 the country, and um, I'm wondering what uh, work has been done through the meat plants on the language issues uh, to ensure that people understand. The, the health and safety issues, the health issues associated with COVID, to, um, and ensure that those meat plants, in fact, they, they ultimately are the employers, are living up to, to those responsibilities mm. in that regard. Yeah, the, the meat plants have, have actually been uh, very well used to, to working with people from other countries and, and have been hugely supported in the work that they do uh, by people from other countries. and. Uh, Using other languages is not something which is new to the meat plants, so so they are quite um, good, good at that type of type of thing and, and being able to communicate um, with people. Um, I think that there is issues not just in the meat plants, but about travel to them. Um, so a lot of people travelling together, even though they've been told not to. And then there's some households where there's people sharing um, the household, even though they're from uh, not from the same families and so forth. Um, so some of the problems are within meat plants, some of the problems are outside of it, uh, but nonetheless we will do our best to work with the communities um, that are doing vital work there and keeping food on their shelves um, to support them. And uh, I know that the meat plants will want to ensure uh, that, that they do that too. I should say some of the level of, of sicknesses or absenteeism in the meat plant, I'm sure um, if I set that as a target for Dennis here, uh, for for his staff, uh, he, he he would have uh, cuckoos. Uh, the, the the numbers are way down in the very low percentages in terms of the absenteeism, uh, but that's nonetheless we, we still need to ensure that they get that support um, and that we don't have the spread of COVID in those facilities or become hotspots. Okay. Just one observation, please. One is in the the issue of transport and uh, the question of uh, the buses being used, the safety of some of the buses in terms of uh, transmission of disease and how safe those are. The second thing is, and a concern has been raised with me, that uh, some people who have come here uh, have come from pretty impoverished backgrounds and their impetus is to work for their families and the like. Yeah. And um, I wouldn't like to think that maybe they were taken risks because they can't feel that they can't afford to support their families and therefore staying on and working maybe them not particularly well health ways so that has been raised with me from within the health service as a concern that they have i understand most plans for testing any anybody who showed any signs at all and were being sent home for two weeks um, on pay um, however, when you're on pay, you don't get overtime, so some people will maybe try and avoid that. Um, but uh, the, the, pl the plants, I believe, have, have sought to respond, um, and some have responded better than others. Um, so some of them were a bit slow off the mark, um, but most of them got there eventually. Uh, but that's, that's, that's one of those tricky situations, um, and we just need to keep a close eye on it.
Minister, okay. oh, sorry, sorry just, to, yeah. just to add two points, just to say that we, we meet weekly with the industry um, and representatives in the industry, to, to keep, and we have done throughout the crisis. In fact, we were in the early days we were meeting three times a week, um, and we, so we monitor the situation closely as it changes. And also, it's fair to say that Robert, um, I'm sure you'd agree, Robert would monitor this very closely, not only because it's important in its own right, but also because we have people working in the plants. So it's, it's very much a direct responsibility for us as employers to make sure that, that um, disease isn't spreading through the plants or that we, we try to uh, deal with it as best we can. So. Thank you. That Robert, does. want to add anything? Or? Sorry, Robert. No, ju no, just to say that the success, such as it has been, of the response has been about collaboration. And my, my own staff have facilitated that. And not just daily, but sometimes multiple daily meetings with the representatives of the, of the meat plants of the of the employers, um, I also need to pay credit to HSE and I and Brian Manson, who uh, was everybody needed to be, and uh, and very quickly, whenever issues came, was prepared to put staff in to carry out audits to provide reassurance to both my own staff and and the staff of the operator that everything was being done that should be done, and also the PHA and Jerry Waldron. Um, fronting up to the industry in some difficult meetings to give them advice that perhaps they didn't want to hear about the things they really needed to do uh, and trade union side. So this has been an exercise in collaboration uh, that is still ongoing and uh, it, has to, it has to keep going uh, yeah. because the virus hasn't gone away. <clears throat> Thank you, Pat Robert. Okay then, um, William. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and can I thank the Minister officials for coming along. I am I suppose I'll declare an interest in a dairy farm or not been a partner in a dairy farm. Uh, but I, I welcome the fact that the Minister has managed to identify those he feels are most needed in relation to the £25 million. Uh, I suppose one can say, no matter what way uh, a decision is made, it's difficult to not have someone. It's not happy, but uh, I mean, I think. I would have thought, and I know there's some, it's not areas and those sectors that the minister tried to support, but I would have thought even in less favoured areas there are dairy farmers, there are beef finishers and there are sheep farmers that should benefit in those areas. Um, in relation to testing, and it was touched on earlier, um, is testing going ahead? Is departmental vet still testing uh, at the moment as normal? Oh. I'll, I'll pass to Robert because he is yeah. the expert on this, as opposed yeah. to me waffling. Uh, at the beginning of the of the current COVID crisis, um, testing dropped to about forty percent. Um, but when the decision was made to exempt calves, it uh, from this is the the forty two to one hundred and eighty calves, not to have to test those, it made a huge difference to the confidence of the vets to go out uh, and carry out testing, both my own vets and, and the private practitioners. And for the last month or so, testing has actually been beyond what we'd normally expect at this time of the year, so it's been well bounced back. Now, it's a, it's a bit of a risky thing to say. We were all concerned that the drop-off in testing would have a result for um, the instance of the disease. So far, we have seen nothing. So we're, we're not on crossing our fingers yet. Uh, but so far, uh, we seem to have been okay as far as the the, the actual uh, shape of the the disease curve is at the moment. So, the 180 days, our evidence now is is that um, farmers are back testing the calves as well, uh, that they've found ways of doing it, um, and uh, so we'll be bringing that back to the minister to look at to see if it's time to consider if it's time maybe to revoke that particular derogation. Okay, in relation to that, that an issue, and I, I'm sure you're all aware of the issue, there was some people importing uh, pedigree rounds from England and Scotland and that an issue getting those tested. I think that has been resolved, hasn't it? A resolved to a degree. Um, we're doing our best. Uh, the, pro the problem is that it really takes two people to hold a sheep and to, uh, to bleed it. Now, we've found an innovative solution. We have a father and son group of always who are, are already in a social bubble. So, so that's, uh, but the number of thousands of sheep that have to be done, I don't think I can expect them to do it all. But is it not possible for, for the... I, I, I had certain circumstances where their own vet was prepared to do it. Yes. And I mean, if that's the case, 
we're, we we're, that, we're looking at all options, including vets doing or the inspectors doing this in the, in the full respirator, uh, which wouldn't be easy and would cause a bit of a concern on farm. But um, we're doing our best to get a method of getting these sheep tested because it's important to the farmers. Okay, thank you. Uh, Claire? Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks to the Minister for being here. And I think there seems to be quite a, a range of disappointed businesses out there um, listening to the, the concerns being raised in regard to the £25 million pound package. So um, I'm going to add another. <laughs> but, Minister, we know that the, the agri and the fish sectors receive annual subsidies, and indeed you've gone to great lengths to make sure that, that those um, subsidies have got out earlier than normal this year. Um, but yet the horticulture sector don't. And we know that the ornamental horticulture sector, they failed to qualify for COVID financial assistance because they fall outside the criteria that was set by the um, economy minister. And we also know that businesses who did qualify for um, financial aid were not required to prove any losses incurred. They got financial assistance simply by meeting the criteria. Um, so it's maybe a wee bit easy to, to look at the criteria being set um, and say that it's actively discriminating against the, the horticulture and other sectors. Um, but you've set the criteria then, particularly for fisheries, for example, and it's very simple and it's very straightforward and it's really based solely on the size of their vessels. So there's no tangible loss um, evidence needed there either. And you've set out a methodology to quantify support for the beef, dairy, sheep sectors as well. Um, and yet the horticulture sector are still waiting. Four months in, they're still waiting. So I want to ask you, Minister, if you can tell us, have you engaged directly with this sector? And if so, what has that been? And also, if you can tell us now what the criteria and mechanisms for this sector to be able to access financial assistance um, you will use. Okay. Yes, the answer is yes, Claire. Um, we have engaged with the horticulture sector, and growers in that sector were affected due to closure of markets for bedding, cut flowers, other plants prior to the reopening of gardens, garden centres. And I raised the flag for the reopening of garden centres and, and went out a bit on the, the limb on it. I um, was criticised by some people. Um, I believe it was the right decision to open garden centres um, that they have operated. Um, well, and they have operated safely and have not contributed to a spread of COVID-19 um, because they are largely outdoors and they are um, lightly trafficked in comparison to many other shops, lots of space, and people are able to social distance in them. Now, horticulture businesses do not pay rates, so they were not able to access the, the DFE monies, the £10 and £25,000. Um, the Horticulture Trades Association carried out a survey of members across the UK and estimated that the potential loss for growers in Northern Ireland to be in the region of 1.75 and 2.6 million. So I met with representatives of the Horticulture Forum on the 18th of June and they confirmed that some growers had problems marketing their produce during the lockdown period. They indicated potential losses lie ahead due to disruption in the crop schedules and reduced amounts of product for future sales. <coughs> so dear staff, have endeavoured to access the potential loss through a survey of growers. <clears throat> Excuse me, and when that's scaled up, it indicates a loss in the region of about one and a half to two million pounds. So to access eligible growers on Deer's RAPO list or have evidence of supply agreements, they'll be expected to provide evidence of loss during the period first of March to thirtieth of June. And the claim for loss will be based on a comparison of accrued sales for the period uh, this year with sales presented in the past three years, and this uh, information should be verified by their accountant. The dear is aware that some growers have received benefit from the self-employment relief scheme, up to £7,500 per person, to compensate for loss in profits, and uh, some have used the furlough scheme for their staff and indeed the bounce back loan scheme uh, in terms of reducing the cost of capital. The support payment that we are offering um, is in the region of um, 1.6 million, I think, um, for that sector. Um, so that money, money will be going out to them. 
um, on the basis of the information that I've just given you. Uh, so that is the, 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 the footprint of the money that we are, uh, I have identified um, up to £1.6 million pounds, um, for the horticulture sector and very happy um, to support them, uh, to help them through the other side of COVID-19. Is the same criteria being um, applied to the other sectors? Is the same criteria going to be applied to farmers and to fishermen? Um, the, the same criteria has been applied to potato farmers um, because it's a similar scenario. Um, you have materials there, it hasn't been sold and so forth. Uh, for milk farmers, it's, it, we, we know what their reduction is um, and we know how much they've produced over that period and so forth. So there, there's a different criteria, I think, for nearly every sector. Um, the horticulture would be more closely aligned um, to what the, the compensation type is for the potato sector. Other businesses who have been able to access business support um, funding, which is based on rates payable um, under the 10 or the £25,000 schemes that were put out, um, they weren't, um, they didn't have to prove losses incurred. They simply got access to finance by meeting that criteria. Um, why, why is this £25 million then going to be different for those who fail to be able to access that? Well, well, I actually think that we're doing it better and in a more publicly accountable way because um, some businesses who got £10,000 didn't go anywhere near to their losses and other businesses £10,000 was, was actually quite a boost. Um, and and we're, we're looking at associating um, the compensation close as we can um, to actual loss taken. So, in the horticulture sector, this is what they've fed into us in terms of the loss, um, and therefore that is what we are offering them uh, in terms of the compensation. Um, but rather than just say there's, for example, 50,000 every horticulture business, um, some may be considerably larger than others, so uh, it is a much better way of doing it to identify um, what your sales were over the course of the last three years, what your sales were this year, um, and there's a difference. And that, that seems to me to be a very fair way of doing it. And uh, would have would have thought that, that within the sector that that would be pretty well received. Okay, so you're content that that's an equitable system then? I think it's a fair way of doing it. And, and that's, to me, that's reasonable. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Claire. Okay, uh, I'm just taking over the role of Cahirlac and Declan's uh, absence. So, uh, John, you're next. I'm behind here, yeah. Um, some of the uh, issues, Chair, have been covered, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the statement, and I want to echo the thank you you gave, Chair, at the start to the uh, respective teams of the Minister, Dennis, and, and others, uh, Robert. Um, I want to pick up on one of the issues, which is the, the rural support packages and, and uh, boost to, to rural economies. Can I ask if any of the programmes outlined by the Minister previously, um, including Tripsy, for example, um, are still in receipt of money that was envisaged from the UK Prosperity Fund. Conversations around that seem to have died away of late, and I'm keen to know, is money from that source still part of those rural packages? And if not, is it likely to be going forward? OK, I'll defer to Dennis on that one. Well, we're still, we're still waiting for more information on that. And uh, again, this may have changed since the last time I heard. Has, this, uh, has there been any developments, Rosemary, you want to...? My most recent understanding, thank you, Dennis and Minister, um, my <laughs> most recent understanding at the end of last week is that um, we should hopefully see some more detail on the Shared Prosperity Fund very, very soon. Um, we have verbally been told um, at NICS level, at official level, that Shared Prosperity Fund will cover um, future rural funding in relation to what you're talking about, but it's only a verbal confirmation at this stage. Okay. If you're going to follow up on that, but it's likely then that we'll be furnished with some information yes. when that's available. Well, maybe, but that would be helpful, and I've been, I've been asked by some people involved that are trying to drive rural business currently. Second question, Chair, um, and I realise it's early days on, on green growth, but I've asked a question in a prior session there with NIEA, 
and around a week ago when Dennis was here with teams about trying to um, maximise opportunities for green growth for tourism. I floated the idea of agritourism not long ago, Minister, in a question to yourself. Um, uh, and I'm keen to look at how we maximise the, the public facilities of the department, the forest parks, the fisheries, yep. um, nature reserves. Um, and the question really is, based on that, are we prepared for engagement with the local councils, other departments, and the other agencies in that regard, or has that timeline still to be set? And if it's still to be set, when are we likely to see it? And, and I'm stressing again, I know we're in the very early days of the strategy. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of tourism, um, we are contributing um, with DFE on that, uh, but I see the opportunities that exist for us as being very exciting. Um, you mentioned um, our, our, our waterways, um, both for actually going out on in terms of boats and, and fishing and so forth. Um, absolutely tremendous. Mm -hmm. They need to be clean waterways, so we need to ensure that they're not being polluted. And that's a course of work that, 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 that we really need to ensure uh, that we do more work to avoid incidents because it's too late whenever the incidents happen. I don't want to be prosecuting people. I want people not to pollute our waterways in the first instance. That would be much better, much better for everybody that's involved. I think that there's great opportunities in terms of the food that we produce. Our seafood is fantastic. Our land-based food is fantastic, whether it is actually for uh, the the meat-based option, or indeed the vegetable-based option, we ha produce so much good food. How can that link in to our tourism, to our restaurants? You know, I look at regions like the Basque region, which is specialised in food, and, and uh, you know, you talk about the Basque region for tourism. What do people talk about? Guggenheim uh, Museum, plus the food. Um, I think we can have a better offer than the Basque region. I think we've got so much more, um, but. The food one, because we can have food from the farm to the fork within 24 hours, within less than that in many instances, um, we have a great opportunity uh, to ensure that uh, we can drive tourism forward. Now, on green growth, I have to say uh, it was my concept, but this man has sort of taken over it. It's very excited whenever you mention the word green growth. So I have a permanent secretary who is... <laughs> Slightly more than totally committed to it, Dennis. Would you like to say anything about green growth? You know, not not too long now. Don't don't go on for a no, for no. An hour. It's, it, I mean, just uh, I mean, just to very much agree with um, what uh, John was saying because uh, it's it's that point, and I think I made it the last time about two dimensions um, working together. That as far as possible, if we can if we can find ways to make um, environmental improvements, um, they they are obviously um, of huge value to people individually and collectively. Um, the question is how can we also make sure that that's reflected by the market and so that you have sustainable businesses um, that actually can improve the environment by, by, by giving it that attention. Um, so I'll, I'll try not to go on, but that's it. <laughs> but the Minister's given me great leeway on it, I have to say. So. And in terms of um, the tourism thing, we have supported um, capital funding in Dava Forest, in Loch Ney, Collin Glen Forest, Gosford Forest Park. We're currently assessing other applications, um, but there's around six and a half million pounds in that fund um, to go out, um, and we believe that um, that'll be something very positive. Thirteen applications have been approved thus far. Thank you. Happy enough, John. Yeah. Morris. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Minister, and thanks very much for taking the time to be here. Uh, the word vet was mentioned quite a lot today. Uh, would, do you, does the Minister think that Northern Ireland would benefit from its own veterinary school? And if he does, does he think that the Department could support such a venture? In short, the answer for me is yes, I do. Um, we're putting out around 10% of the UK's product in terms of ag agriculture, and we don't have our own veterinary, veterinary college. And veterinary colleges are expensive to run, and therefore quite a challenge. Um, but I do know that Rain is looking at the potential development of a veterinary college. Uh, I would be pressing 
heavily that, that that should happen. I think it's a bit of a game changer for us. We're actually currently facing difficulties in getting vets, and uh, many of our young people leave here uh, to go elsewhere to do the training. And when people leave here, they're slightly more difficult to get back. So I think training people to be vets here um, would be a wonderful asset to us. Robert, top vet in the country. <laughs> you and Dad. Um, over 100 young people a year um, leave this area to go to Europe for training in veterinary every year, whether that's to Warsaw, Budapest, Bruno, and a number of places. And they do that because they're they're at, at great expense to themselves because there isn't access on these islands to enough places uh, for what's required. And the demographics of the veterinary profession has meant that uh, we need more people, we need more vets, um, and we need vets particularly to work in the farm vet uh, arena, uh, compared with companion animals, both for the type of work and the, the let's face it, the, the type of living to be made companion animals is more attractive than farm animals. So we need to attract people who want to do that sort of work. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I have no opinion as to where that should be. I think the, probably the best answer is a collaborative effort against uh, involving all the universities and institutes in Northern Ireland here. Caffrey could have a role to play. Afby could have a role to play. Both Ulster and Queen's, I feel, could have a role to play. And perhaps even collaborating with universities elsewhere. I have seen examples of universities um, 200 miles apart in Japan, for example, who collaborate very closely using the type of technology we're using here today um, to deliver lectures remotely. And those, that sort of technology could make the course affordable. And we have great opportunity here, I think, to do something good and something special. But it'll cost money. Thank you very much, Minister. Happy Morris. Thank you. Okay. Uh, given that there's nobody else uh, and the chair's not back yet, I'm just going to ask one brief question before I let you go, and it, possibly to Rosemary, because you had outlined earlier that for the 25 million in terms of the payments, there's going to have to be legislation passed, and you're hoping to get the yep. payments in August. I, I just got a text uh, in the last sort of half hour from a constituency office from a farmer who's asking how does he get his money. So the, each of the sectors, I, I gather, is going to be different. There will be, I mean, you, you'll be engaging with the sector and how, you, yep. the, and there'll be an application form, I presume. So we'll be giving that information all in good time. Rosemary. Um, yeah. The intention is that farmers will be asked to complete a simple application form um, indicating um, which funding they wish to avail of or that they wish to avail of funding and to provide supporting evidence if they are required to do so in the case of horticulture or potatoes, as Minister outlined. Um, we are trying to avoid an overly bureaucratic system um, that would create additional paperwork and make it complex for farmers, so it will be something relatively simple in line with the criteria that Minister outlined. Um, and a lot of the delivery mechanisms will rely on data that the department holds, or in the case of um, milk producers, that the milk purchasing company, the milk processor, holds. Yeah. So, trying to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, the effort system, we've the effort system. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, thanks very much, Minister, and, well. uh, and your team for coming. All the best. Let's go. Thank you. We have more of those badges, Rosemary, if you need any more of them. Oh, no. <laughs> you them. like my yellow badge? <laughs> okay, so we'll just uh, keep moving. Uh, we're on to item six now, the direct payments to farmers, SR. So can I refer members to the memo from the clerk at pages 62 to 63? The draft SR and expanded uh, memorandum and correspondence from the department are at pages 64 to 70. So members will recall the SL1 was considered by the committee on 15 May, at which stage the committee was content with the merits of the policy. The SR will allow farmers to make changes to their single application uh, due to the difficulties they, they make, may have had in finalising their applications due to COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, the examiner of SR uh, 
statutory rules highlighted that the department was in breach of the 21-day rule, but she was <coughs> content with the explanation from the department. She also highlighted a drafting error which the department intends to correct by way of a correction slip. So, if members are content, uh, I'm just going to put the question that the Committee of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2020-81, the direct payments to farmers single application amendment date uh, amendment coronavirus regulations NA 2020 and has no objections to the rule. Okay. 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 Okay, so that's item seven. Okay, uh, item eight. No, item seven. You're doing item Sorry, we're just we're commencing item seven. Um, the waste fees and charges amendment regulations now are in 2020. Uh, the memos are page 72, the SRs are page 74, with the explanatory memorandum at 76. You'll recall that the SL1 was considered by the committee on the 18th of June, and we were content that the policy moved to the next legislative stage. The purpose of the SR is to update fees and charges for the registration of brokers, dealers and carriers of waste, and the processing of registration for exemptions from waste management and licensing. Are we okay to put the question? Um, that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Affairs is concerned SR 2021-12, 20, uh, the waste fees and charges amendment regulations uh, now in 2020, and there's no objection to the rule. Okay. Okay, so departmental uh, written briefing, COVID-19 update. Uh, it's at uh, page 80 to 92 of your pack. Um, um, if members have any questions relating to the update, they can forward them to the close of, uh, to the, the clerk by uh, the close of play today. Um, are we okay to publish the committee's on the committee's web page an issue to take <coughs> relation to the publication? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is our, our last meeting until the summer recess, and can I suggest to members that we get a further COVID briefing at our first meeting in September. Therefore, I can suggest that we move to monthly updates and then drop it if necessary. And we can re review this if, ne if, uh, if things change. Okay. Um, can I refer members to the uh, draft Fisher's report, 94, page 94 to 120? We we'll recall that the, we last considered the report at the meeting on the 23rd of April. It was agreed to defer publishing the report until the Fisheries Bill resumed its passage through Westminster. The Bill uh, will now have its third reading in the House of Lords today. If members are content, they will put the question that the Committee um, of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs um, orders a report on the Legislative Consent Memorandum on the UK Government Fisheries Bill 2019-2020 to be printed. Okay. Uh, number 10, uh, the Committee Motion on Climate Change. I want to refer members to the memo from the clerk at page 122 to 123. I want members to note the procedural and timing advice from the clerk at paragraphs 3 to 5. Um, uh, Philip, do you want to elaborate on that there? Yeah, I mean, just briefly, uh, I mean, there's a lot of work ongoing uh, that, that I think needs to be encompassed within the Climate Act, and it is something that, that was prescribed within the NDNA. It's something that the Assembly uh, members ha have agreed is necessary through a, a PMB uh, that was passed earlier. I mean, w we talk about uh, the green growth strategy. That's very important. We had our discussion yesterday on the environmental bill, and you know the majority of the committee support uh, our own environmental bill. There's other uh, departments within the executive will be taken forward. You know, economic recovery plans or maybe infrastructure recovery plans. And I think all of the, those issues should be encompassed within the targets and guidelines of a climate act. We are the only uh, region of these islands that, that doesn't have that type of legislation. Uh, you know, and I, I know the minister saying he's not against it, but he, he may be, uh, in my view, prolonging it. And, and I think it's something that lands within the remit of this committee. And I mean, what I'm asking for is basically support that the committee uh, takes a motion asking for the minister maybe to be a, a bit more proactive uh, and to put a time frame on him actually bringing uh, legislation before the assembly. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Member, yep. Yeah. I'm concerned for some of it now, but uh, it's up to the committee to decide themselves what they want to do. But. Uh, I think it's probably a bit of overkill in my eyes. Yep. I think we, um, we, 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 
The environment bill coming to Northern Ireland is, is actually extending what we have had for Europe for years. I mean, this is not. Uh, I think I. I'm not so sure uh, an independent environmental agency, for instance, has anyone any evidence that that will make things any different? It'll just cost now a few million. I'm not sure how many million, but it'll cost a lot of money. Yeah. But I'm not sure it'll make any difference. And any other members want to comment on that? No? Yeah, except to, to appeal to, to members to, to try to come on board with this if they can. All of us um, have heard the conversations around uh, emissions and emissions targets and the need to have them here um, as they are and, and have them here with ambition as other places have done. Um, it's quite separate to anything, not unrelated, but separate to the Environment Bill in that this is a separate um, strand of work where Th th this place would seek to do better in terms of carbon emissions. The Environment Bill, uh, as William pointed out quite rightly, is part of a, a political process and determined by others a number of years ago, and, and we have to put things in place for the 1st of January. We know all that. This is separate. This is seeking to do better environmentally in a, an action done by those of us who legislate in this place. And in that regard, we can see it as an individual action to be taken by us and it would be very good I think for all of us and for those outside who support these actions if we could be seen to be taking this as a collective action. Yeah, that's another yeah, just uh, like to be associated with William's comments that I don't think it's called for it. I think it's fine, you know. Uh, Patrick, do you put your hand up there? Yeah, uh, thanks Sharon. I would like to support Philip there in the, the the general thrust of what he's proposing and maybe add a bit to it just as far as uh, if we can it's more how we do things rather than maybe enhance it a wee bit uh, that's through the protection of jobs and upskilling people in carbon intensive sectors um that's that's what i would say i think this is great potential and uh, i think we should lift it and, and make it our own in the interests of future society there Thanks, Chair. Um, look, I fully support it. Um, and this, uh, uh, I would really like this to be understood. It's not party political. It's not directed to minister. It's just absolutely critical for the way forward. And it's great to see the minister taking on um, initiatives such as the Green Growth Strategy. And we may ping pong that back between ourselves uh, and whatever. But everything is moving towards this. And I don't see how we can start to build it. And exactly what Patsy's saying there in terms of the, the sector in job skills and um, in you know supporting green growth strategy. We hear that Dennis, the permanent secretary, is right behind us, you know, and we've got so much work going on out there that something needs to be set in legislative terms um, to give that baseline measure for everybody to then begin to build and move forward on. And I think it all starts with a climate change act. We are the only part across these islands who don't have it. Um, and I think that when we look to Scotland, I get very jealous anyway when I look to Scotland. Um, but this has huge potential and it's not about one thing over the other or trying to supersede anything. It's about creating a baseline from which all else can build. And I think this is critical. Right. I think this is something that we've we've got to look into is a climate change act. And I think I'm not so sure about the total wording of it, but I do think we've got to work with the work with the minister and make him aware of it and try and make a bit of progress on climate change. Maybe faster than what's happening. Okay, Thank you, Chair. I, I, uh, I have no issues with, with it uh, per se, other than of a concern that it may be uh, causing duplication and maybe an unnecessary cost. That, given that, anything that improves the environment and climate, welcome. But I just would caveat is it a duplication of what we're going to do later on down the line, or is it going to be at a cost that we maybe can't afford? Other than that. Philip, I mean, ju just uh, I mean an answer to, to Morris. I, I don't think it's going to cause duplication. I, I think it's absolutely necessary 
uh, as, as some have said, and it is, I mean, it is something that all the parties agreed to in the NDNA. So, uh, yep. you know, it's not something that should be controversial. It, 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 as I say, it's something that other parts of these islands have, and other parts of the world have. I mean, we're, we're in the in the immediate mouth of a global health pandemic. But we shouldn't let that take our sights off the fact that, that we are also in the mouth of, of a global environmental uh, pandemic. Pandemic is probably the wrong word, but you know we need to take uh, action, and I don't think we can wait to begin to take action. Uh, just in terms of the the motion, I am more than happy to support Patsy's uh, insertion of words. You know, if he wants to maybe suggest where he thinks it should be inserted. Uh, but I, I think that adds to the, the motion. So, Can I uh, just add then that the committee needs to decide that we want a debate on climate change before we decide on the wording of a motion okay. as well. So that's something we just need to agree before we move ahead. I, right? I think I will say this, Mr Chairman, and I'm, I'm all on for protecting the environment. I mean, COVID-19 has proven that man himself is a big problem. The planes are parked, the cars are, half the cars weren't on the road. And the missions were massively down. So man needs to man we, we can say that everyone wants to drive their big cars, but we don't want you know, as long as it doesn't affect me, that's okay. And I think everyone has to play their part if we're if we're gonna be successful in delivering on this. Okay. I would propose them that we uh, have this debate. Well, what's the consensus about the committee having uh, a debate on climate change at the next available plenary? Is there committee no. consensus in this? Well, no. Not enough. When is it supposed to be? Next available one, William. That'll not be to September, will it? Probably not. Unless there's. That will be decided next week yeah. at, bus at the business, business committee. I think we'll. Decide that. Um, next Tuesday is the next business committee meeting, um, and then we'll get down really from the executive notification from the executive whether they need um, any plenary sessions to get through legislation during July. Um, but we don't know yet. That's still to be confirmed. Okay, so we'll go through that hurdle now. So we've agreed that uh, to the debate tonight, now, um, and we'll open up for discussion on the proposed wording of the motion. Uh, as a par paragraph six, um, page 123 of the pack. He's writing and find it. We have um... right. so proposed word in the motion. So we've got the proposed word at Paragraph six, the draft motion is there. So, Chair, uh, I mean, I, I would propose the draft motion as is with the insertion of the suggestion from Patsy with regard to just, just transition and those in mm -hmm. carbon intensive uh, economy. Jobs, sorry. Chair. Yes, Chair. Can I propose. Um, a slight amendment as well, um, and it's just to recognise that climate change is a human rights issue, um, and that a just and green recovery is, should be ambitious. I have wording that I can send through if you want. It's just it is just a few words. Well, you would need to see the wording so that you could make a decision on it. So if Claire wants to slowly read it out i can jot it down and patsy would need to tell me where in the yeah. FA. if patsy if you yeah. look at if you look at every yeah. line there yeah. every line Sorry, of the motion the, the place there where it can fit in is um is underpinned by decarbonization um and the protection and then it could be inserted there something along the lines i'm not you look uh, at line three the decarbonization right. and the transition to protect jobs through the upskilling of people in carbon intensive sectors. Does that sound just slow down? Yeah. Patrick, just, can you just yeah. repeat that only a bit slower for Stella to take a note yeah. of? So Patsy McLean, okay. line three um, line three after uh, decarbonization. decarbonization. No, sorry, it's yes, it's it's the second line from the bottom. 
Oh, second line from the bottom. Okay. Okay. Perhaps see that you, is. You let me see. That any um, economic recovery strategy is underpinned, underpinned by, by decarbonisation. Okay. Um, that is line. That is line fourteen. Okay. Uh, after decarbonisation. After decarbonisation, with transition to protect jobs uh, and upskill people. To through, uh, sorry, through upskilling people in carbon intensive sectors. Protect jobs and. Hang on. Patsy managed to. And upskills. Or through. People. Upskilling people in, in carbon intensive sectors. In carbon intensive sectors okay i have that one if i can get claire's then i think patsy and you both have left out just in terms of transition yeah, sorry, just just. <laughs> okay well, so after, after, after i was trying to after... tweak it around there so um underpinned by decarbonization with decarbonization and transition to protect jobs and upskill people and and through upskilling people in carbon intensive sectors, I think it's probably a better form of work I'm anyway. This. I'm not getting this at all. Sorry, line 14, after decarbonisation, Patsy, could mm -hmm. you repeat your exact wording very slowly, please? And my apologies, yeah. I'm just not catching it at all. Sorry, to protect jobs through upskilling people to in carbon intensive yeah, sectors. Slow, slow bit, so we protect jobs. And protect jobs and through upskilling people in carbon intensive sectors through upskilling people in carbon intensive sectors intensive sectors intensive sectors okay so after decarbonization Mm -hmm. With just transition to protect jobs through upskilling people in carbon, carbon intensive in carbon intensive sectors. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, have with just okay, and then Claire, if I can have your wording, please. Slowly, you can hear it very slowly. <laughs> in line seven. And it says green growth strategy. After green growth strategy, okay. It already says that on line seven. Hang on. Line seven. Sorry, Claire, I don't have oh, that's line eight for me. Yep. Minister's oh, commitment to green growth strategy, line eight. Mm. Yep. So after green growth strategy, then insert recognizes climate change. Recognizes climate change as a human rights issue. As a okay. human rights issue. That risks deepening. That risks deepening existing inequalities. Existing in a qualities and then the motion says after that recognizes the need for a stimulus led sorry hang on recognizes That's the need for a stimulus led recovery yes okay mm -hmm. yeah. just add, it recognizes the need for a stimulus led just and green recovery so that is line currently line nine it'll be a different line now um after stimulus led just and green just add those three words. Stimulus led just and green recovery. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I have three words. <laughs> I know it's been really picky, but <laughs> if possible. Um, so after that, we go down another one, two, three sentences where it says um, introduce a climate change act with legally binding. Okay. Line. Um, Line 12, says, yeah. My lines might be different from yours. Sorry. So, Climate Change Act with a legally binding, and I want to insert the word ambitious, legally sectoral. Binding after. 
Binding. Binding. Ambitious. Insert. Ambition. Ambitious. 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 Okay. And then down to Patsy's decarbonisation. <laughs> yeah. But just make it a, a rapid decarbonisation. Hang on, up to so um, Patsy's. You're suggesting an amendment to the amendment where it is with just and rapid no, transition. No, it's no, no, decarbonisation. It's not an amendment to my bit. No, no, it's just down to your own decarbonisation. <laughs> Where, where Patsy came in there, and the economic recovery strategy is underpinned by, I'm going to say, a rapid decarbonisation. Rapid. Okay, so mm -hmm. that is line, line thirteen, rapid. Yeah, that's all. The decarbonisation. Two. Okay. Okay. I got sent to you, Stella. You want you want an amendment as well? No, I have it sent to you. Your emails. <laughs> Okay. You've been you've been doing that. Does that this is your skills as a as a an editor, seeing the newspaper mm. man? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to read that out? I'd send it round to the other members. Send it round, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to send. Um, thank you very much. And somebody's been doing my job for me. So uh, I'm going to send this <laughs> draft motion uh, to use now. Okay, so you can actually see it. And um, just her email, yes, because my tablet's flat. <laughs> oh, okay, yes, just to, just to your email. Committee member. Send that to the shared on the screen here for everybody to look at. Send. Okay, if you want to get that in a minute there, and just make sure that, are, that it, it reflects what you all wanted in it. Because I was going to have to suggest that we that just that I was going to have to take ten minutes to go out and write this up properly. Oh, so not supporting this, okay? You're. And I'm not really supporting it, no. Okay. okay. I don't, might it be useful, Chair, to, to find out? And I understand there are those who, who want to add their, their own words, and um, <clears throat> that I respect that totally. Um, might it be? advisable to gauge as well if the original wording was more likely to attract cross-party support and not predicting one way or the other well. but in the interest of achieving a result it might be better to, to look at um, what might have been acceptable to the greater number of people yeah, what was probably. presented originally you should have agreed i mean that we missed that um are you content to see option Devin in your in your chair's brief where it says option? There, there's nothing put forward that I can't support, for I example. We didn't you didn't check that first because we we should have checked that first before you called for amendments. Oh, okay. So whether they're content with the proposed motion is drafted or by amendments. Mm -hmm. So Uh, so, can we take the opinion of members on whether they're content with the proposed motion as drafted or require amendments? I'm happy with either. I mean, I'm happy to support the amendments. There's nothing on it that I could uh, would be unhappy with. Okay. Right, that's all, isn't it? Hmm? Right, it's already through, yes? It, I've sent it. Yeah, I don't know if it's yeah, gone through. Thank you. Um, members, um, it may I've be it, it, yeah. that you know, Decca, you know, it may be that you want to just say, um, uh, you finish up this business, the rest mm -hmm. of the committee business, and then take ten minutes, let members go away and look oh, at both and come back. Okay. Or you could, if you wanted Sorry, to, chair. I could organise a Microsoft Teams meeting on say chair. Friday morning. Okay, Pat, hang on, we Pat, 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 did you hear what Stella proposed there? I was, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, we didn't. Sorry, what was that? Do you want to say No, no, you can go ahead, Stella. Um, Excuse me. Sorry, Jerry. Patsy wants to say something. Go ahead, Patsy. Sorry, I didn't pick up on that last bit there. Excuse me. Okay. Um, I was going to suggest that if you, we finish the rest of the committee business, go through the rest of the stuff that's on the committee agenda, and then if you okay. want, we can suspend for 10 minutes. You can go off and look at the original motion and the motion as amended, and then come back and discuss it. Or if you want, I can organize the alternative to that. 
is to organise a, a Microsoft Teams meeting for um, Friday morning, where you can get together and discuss it after you've had time, further time to look at it. Hey, that's no bad idea. I don't see the need for it. Uh, I mean, I, I think people have a sight of this motion. The amendments haven't changed the tenant of the. You know, I'm happy to give ten minutes leeway, but I mean, I don't think whether we discuss it now or discuss it on Friday, people's opinions are going to change. I say that people have had sight of the original motion, and I don't think the amendments have done anything other than probably strengthen the, the motion. So, I mean, I, I think an extra meeting is unnecessary. I mean, I'm happy to take ten minutes recess for people to look at it. Or five minutes. I, support, uh, I don't think we need to have another Microsoft team meeting on this. You know, ten minutes have a look at the text, and we should be able to determine it. Okay, um, Claire, do you want to come in there? I'm absolutely fine with it. I don't even need the ten minutes. I'm content and supportive. <laughs> well, listen. Do we, why don't we take the option of go th finish off the the remainder? We just got first bonds deal with, right? And forward work program. And the forward program. Program. If we if we can finish this off, take ten minutes then, and then that'll that'll help sort of trash out what we need to do. Is that okay? Okay. Right. So we'll, we'll just move on to correspondence, right? It's page. It's in the table. Of papers page three to four of your packs, and there are a number of items I want to draw attention to. Item four is correspondence to the department on the launch of a discussion document on the future recycling and separation collection of household waste. This consultation was run for 14 weeks, alongside the RAP report on the recycling potential here. The committee will receive a briefing on waste management in September. Item 6, the Scottish Parliament's Committee um, on Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform report on the Environment Bill. The committee was unable to make a recommendation in respect of the LCM and will lodge its legislative consent motion in August. Can I seek the committee agreement to notify the Scottish uh, Committee of the outcome of our LCM debate? And can I also seek agreement to forward the ERA Committee's report to our MPs? Mm -hmm. okay. um, 10. Correspondence from the EU Affairs Officer on Common Frameworks was require Assembly scrutiny, Assembly Committee scrutiny. Can I uh, seek agreement to forward the letters referred to within this correspondence to the Department for comment and to outline how it intends to engage the Committee? Are members uh, content to action the remainder of the correspondence as outlined in the index page? Okay. Um, I want to ask members, uh, do members have any other items of business they wish to raise before we move into the closed session? No. No. Right, the next meeting then will take place, um, an informal meeting will take place on Thursday, uh, this, this Thursday, uh, at 2 p.m. Tomorrow. Tomorrow at 2 p.m. Okay, can I seek agreement to move into the closed session for the consideration of the motion issue and the forward work programme? Right. Okay. Yeah.